And you all set? Okay, let me call to order the Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency meeting for um, September 22nd. If you'll please rise. It's not on? Miranda, they're saying it's not on. Can you hear it now? Hello, hello? Okay, all right. Um, Charlotte, please. Raise your hand over your heart and follow me in the pledge to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Um, roll call, please. Chair Mulhart. Here. Director Craven. Here. And Director Kelly. Here. Director Borchard. Here. Okay. Sam uh, McIntyre is in the audience. That's the only alternate I see. Um, there we go. That's the only alternate I see. Now you can hear me because I can hear myself. <laughs> That's not a good thing. <laughs> um, agenda review. Anything? Any changes on the agenda? Uh, there has been a request by the general manager of Zone Mutual to pull the item dealing with the credit transfer. Uh, apparently, she's out of town and won't be back until the uh, October meeting. So okay. If that one can be pulled if your board okay. so desires. Uh, that'll be fine. All right, and that'll be item number five. So we'll pull that. And Director Bennett is here. Okay. <laughs> um, it's not a, a change in the agenda, but just for everybody's um, having looked through the agenda and recognizing there's some items that may uh, take a little more discussion than others and I think deserve a little more discussion than others. What I'm going to do is on some of the items, I'm just going to receive the information if that's okay with everybody and, and unless you have specific questions so that we can get through these agendas. Otherwise, we're going to be at the mercy of the clock and 4.30, and I think you have to leave at 4.30 and, and, and Steve at 4. So if you'll indulge with me, um, I may go through some of these fairly quickly and cut off some talking here. And I say that to staff. I've already told Gerard um, on his item dealing with financial budgets if we can just receive it. So if I cut down staff, I want you to understand I'm trying to move us to the point where we, where we can have the discussions that we need to have on those items that I think we'll have, in fact have discussions. And then um, if we have time left over, we can go back and add to some other items. So um, bear with me. Uh, with that, um, the one change to the agenda, uh, we've rolled that to next month, public comments. Anybody in the audience have any comments for the GMA on uh, non-agenda items? OK, board member comments? OK. We have a consent agenda, a, a motion, and a second. Any dis changes, discussions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, hearing none. Okay, let's go to item number four. Afternoon, Chairman Hart, directors. Uh, for the record, Brian Bondi with United Water and the GMA. Uh, item four is our <coughs> credits study session follow up. Uh, as you recall, we held a credit study session in July where you heard a presentation from staff uh, framing the issues re uh, revolving around conservation credits, and we also touched a bit on irrigation efficiency issues. We heard stakeholder comment, uh, had some board member discussion, and ultimately uh, you directed staff to put this item back on the agenda, this time as an action item so that you could direct staff or SAG or another committee as you feel appropriate to look at issues resolving, uh, revolving around the credits. I believe I have some slides here. Uh, what we'd like is to that, do... Is that as bright as we can get it? Yeah, that's not too good. Oh, it's powering up, I think. Uh, <clears throat> the way we've, uh, as you can see in the board letter, the way we've laid this follow-up session out is three parts. Um, one is just to have an opportunity to briefly recap any of the information that was presented in July. 
Uh, secondly, we'll have a time for stakeholder discussion and board member discussion. Uh, we have received a request from one uh, pumper to go through a couple slides. Uh, Robert Aranio from Crestview will be doing that. They have some ideas on uh, some potential uh, credit management um, aspects. And then lastly, assuming that the board wants to continue the discussion, con continue to look at conservation credit issues, uh, we're asking for direction to staff to research specific issues that you feel need to be looked at in more detail before you can make decisions and also perhaps to assign SAG or some other committee to look at policy implications of different aspects of the credits. And this might uh, be something along the lines of an M&I type group to look at M&I issues and AG to look at AG issues. Uh, one of the comments I've heard about the SAG process is that it's underrepresented by AG, so that's the reason uh, for suggesting that maybe we want to break it out a little bit differently. Maybe that subcommittees of SAG or something, something like that. In terms of, of just recapping the study session, um, obviously for the sake of time, we're not going to go back through all the information that was presented. We just want to recap some of the highlights. Of course, we're talking about conservation credits, not storage credits. Um, the issue resolves around the, revolves around the large number of conservation credits on the books. You'll recall the number 600,000 is what we're showing on the books. Approximately 450,000 of those 600,000 are in what we would consider active operator accounts. These are accounts that have had activity within the last five years. Um, a big issue, uh, it's not just that these credits exist. Uh, really, the issue resolves, revolves around the fact that the ordinance code has no redemption rules for the conservation credits. There's, there's no rules that say you can only redeem so much and when or anything like that. And uh, what we see... Uh, our concerns. Uh, staff does not think that this issue is completely a red herring. We think that um, for folks that are trying to do the right thing, folks that are in this room, uh, it's not really an issue. Credits are about balancing between wet and dry years for the most part. But it could be that there are folks out there that um, <clears throat> might want to s seek ways to use credits for financial gain and other things, and that's really where the, the issues um, in, in our mind resolve, revolve around. And so if credits, if it turns out, and I think Lynn, this is quoting Lynn, um, Director Mohart, that if credits interfere with achieving sustainability, that the agency should take a long, hard look at uh, its policies and uh, try and prevent loopholes for, for things that may get in the way. And there's really three things we see uh, that credits may be impacting uh, the agency's ability to achieve its goals. Reversing progress made via the 5% cutbacks through the use of credits. Um, that's probably the minor concern of the three. Uh, the second is, is it, is it the case that credits may be used to continue to rely on groundwater as opposed to making investments in supplemental water, whether we're talking about great or water they may become available through various projects that are proposed in the Las Postas Valleys and other locations. And lastly, uh, could it be the case that folks may find ways to uh, develop a market for credits? And that could be as simple as somebody selling water to another person and using credits to offset the surcharge uh, to make that water available to another entity. Uh, these were the credit management options that were put up on the screen uh, with the exception of option five. Um, I won't go back through those. Suffice it to say that there's different things that we, different approaches that could be looked at for managing the redemption or accumulation of conservation credits. Um, these, these options probably are best looked at uh, M&I M and, and AG uh, separately. The fifth one there, this credit redemption fee that you see in red, this is the idea that Robert's going to speak about during the stakeholder process, and I'll, I won't... Uh, delve into that. I'll leave that for, for, for Robert to elaborate on. And again, after the stakeholder uh, discussion is done and board member discussion is done, assuming that uh, the issue is going to be continued to be debated, we're looking for, for specific issues that the board wants us to research and uh, have discussion about. Uh, we would appreciate direction to perform those tasks and if you see fit to develop committees, again, either through the SAG process or through some other process, 
um, we're recommending that we make uh, the board make specific assignments to those committees with deadlines and deliverables so that we can keep the discussion and process moving along. Okay, great. Anybody have, uh, before I go to the audience, uh, anybody from the audience have any specific questions for Brian or board members? Okay, all right, thank you, Brian. Um, Robert, I know you want to speak. Um, why don't we go ahead and start with you, and if there's anybody else that wants to speak, wants to speak we'll listen to them as well. Thank you. So if you could please change the, oh, there you go. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair, and thank you, Board, for the opportunity to talk. Uh, it was my understanding after the last meeting that you were also going to be seeking some stakeholder input, so I took that opportunity in order to uh, present myself with a chance of putting my foot in my mouth and come up with an idea in order to address this issue. I am Robert Aranio with Crestview Mutual Water Company here speaking on behalf of Crestview as our board of directors has reviewed this proposal and has endorsed me to come on and speak with you about it. Okay. The objectives of what I'm going to be trying to present today and discuss with you about is to address uh, staff's concerns as they presented last meeting on the unregulated nature of some credit redemption that's currently going on and to use a market-based approach in order to prevent the abuse of that system, provide a financial disincentive in order to uh, make sure that there is not the run on the bank or the transfer that you have expressed concern about. What this will not address and what this presentation does not even touch is the possible over allocation of the resource as it currently stands within the GMA. Nor does it touch the ag efficiency issues and it has no statements about stored storage credits that are already approved, whether that be the Cayagas ASR well field or any other program such as the GREAT program that you've already adopted also. Again, to uh, frame the problem as staff has presented that there's been a, a large amount of credits on the books that we've heard about that are currently unregulated and unmanaged as to how those credits can be pumped out and who can pump them and whereabouts and when. Um, also, staff has presented a very convincing chart showing that the uh, redemption of those credits has been accelerating um, inversely to the amount of the cutbacks that have been going on uh, over the past couple of years. And they've also expressed the uh, uh, concern that there's uh, going to be a further increase in the redemption of uh, credits. Uh, this is a chart that we've been familiar with that's already been shown uh, as to what historical pumping has been uh, within the GMA and what's been going on, showing that the assumptions uh, originally being 120,000 acre feet have now been reduced to approximately 100,000 acre feet. And when you factor that in, that we are continuing to um, use the resource that's very limited. Um, also that we have seen with uh, recent decisions and coming on with the uh, Freeman diversion that we're probably going to have less, less water due to environmental issues and that we have uh, seen our imported water supply become unstable in my opinion as to what we can have each and every year as uh, issues continue in the Bay Delta. We've also seen uh, crop rotations that have probably led to an increase in demand. Um, Irrigation efficiency pumping now is accounting for almost 20,000 or got a 20,000 acre foot a year increase. These credits that are in the blue here are already managed and already have a plan in place that you have approved as to how those credits are to be drawn out and when they can be drawn out and a safety belt is in place in order to make sure that those are not impacting other pumpers around there in order to make sure safeguards in place and staff has expressed a serious concern about this 603,000. Uh, as a side note, there's ongoing discussions about the validity of that 603,000 and what is actually the amount that's in play that yet needs to be quantified further. But for purposes of this discussion, I'm going to deal with the whole pot. Staff presented at the last meeting also how the redemption of credits has continued to increase as the 5% cutbacks have gone on. So all this is set in the groundwork as to why there's a perceived problem and perceived opportunity in order to go ahead and abuse the storage that's out there, whether or not it's real. The proposal that we're presenting today is ra rather simple. Go ahead and allow the pumpers to have their historical and baseline allocations each and every year. 
And for every 10% that you pump above that, there's a $100 surcharge. With the money being paid, the surcharge money being paid directly to the GMA and restricted then in order to fund physical solutions, whether that is a new water source, whether that's a pipeline, whether it's a study in order to address the issue. Now, this has potential here of self-regulating itself that when you get to the 100%, when someone has actually doubled what their allocation is, now you're already at the established surcharge that is within the GMA. Cost analysis in order to see how this works and what the effectiveness of it is. I'm going to use my my well, Crestview Excuse well me. number six. A pump Excuse me. Let me ask you to go back one. Sorry? You lost me with that last thing. I got your first thing, point one, ten percent above. Right. Mm -hmm. So if someone pumps in 20% above their allocation, yeah, they'll go up to $200 an acre foot, and yeah. every 10% it ratchets it. up. Okay. okay. So is when it, you're at 100%, it, it, you're pretty close to what the existing surcharge is at of 1,150. Okay. Is the um, is the is the proposed fee only for that 10%, or is it retroactive to everything that was pumped? No, it's only incremental for each 10% as so, it goes up. So for the last tier, tier, he's paying full bore charges. Yes. And incrementally down. Okay. Yes. So on average, if he pumped his allocation plus historical allocation, uh, if he doubled his pumping, mm -hmm. he would pay a 50% surcharge. Correct. Over the full range of the money that's being talked about. Okay. And so no taking other, that into effect, sorry. And no other, no, the other surcharges, et cetera, that apply for over pumping wouldn't wouldn't be applying in this situation. Well, in this case, you'd still be cashing in credits in order to cover, so you wouldn't have that GMA surcharge. But there is a, a point there where the next acre foot of water becomes so cost prohibitive that it self-regulates itself. So an example here, uh, Crestview's well number six, we pump 1,350 gallons a minute and it costs us $130 an acre foot in order to get that water out operationally and get it into our system. Uh, scenario number one, uh, let's say we pump 850. We have a historical right now of 800 acre feet. So we, let's say a typical year or correction, an anomalous year like last year where we had our imported water supply reduced and we pumped over, let's say we pumped an additional 50 acre feet of water. We were going to cash in 50 acre feet of credits. We would generate a credit redemption fee of $5,000 that would be paid to the GMA and then reserved as for physical solutions and the average cost per acre foot goes from $130 to $135 an acre foot. Let's ratchet this up to uh, scenario number two, where someone is going to really go after the amount of water that they have. Incidentally, the 1,500 acre feet represents 300 acre feet greater than what my total system demand is. So this addresses a concern that I heard about possibly someone moving water across the street and living off credits. What does this do? Well, there the credit fee or the surcharge generates $342,000 that is paid to GMA and the average cost comes to $358 an acre foot. At first glance, it doesn't look like it works. But the problem is, or what it does do, is as you take a look at the graph on the side, the next acre foot of water becomes so expensive that essentially at that point in time, and actually before that, I'm now paying more than what if I was to buy it from Cayegas under penalty. So there is a placeholder in there is a, a another source of water that then becomes more cost effective and stops me from going any farther. As long as Cayegas's water stays at that price, I mean, if we get have water, it just costs money. I mean, I mean, we're we're, we're going to see, and I'm, I'm I'm not trying to argue. I'm I'm just trying to get everything out on the table. I mean, we have this distinct possibility that we're going to see in the next five, ten years significantly significant increases in the cost of water. Yes, that's potentially true. Yeah. But I think, but but I think, if you take the concept, the, the essential concept is a market-driven fee against redemption that escalates with increase, and we can either change Bob's numbers to some other set of numbers mm -hmm. to get what we want, or have reserve the right that if the system is not working, then at the three-year point adjust the numbers. I mean, right. we, we can, if, if the essential concept is, is to make it a market-driven penalty that is disincentive with increased demand, 
then we could reserve the right to change those numbers going forward and then reflect the fact that Kiegas' numbers have changed, our numbers will change. So you have all that. As we increase the surcharge penalties, we need to drive these numbers up to match the surcharge penalties so that the whole thing is working as a concert and it's then truly market driven because that's what the marketplace is. Correct. Okay. In summary, what this allows basically is as a pumper, as M&I, where we have access to the credits. We can get to them when we need them. It provides the market force, as been stated, in order to disincentive, create a disincentive to prevent the abuse, and then also generates revenues in order to help fund physical solutions. We, right now, within the GMA, are very idea rich. We're cash poor. We know where we want to put the water. we got ideas about the projects that we need to put in place. We have no mechanism to fund them. We have no way of generating the revenue. And then this also allows for it to be fine-tuned, whether a basin-specific plan is put in place like the Las Postas Basin is working on. We may not even use this approach, but for the general uh, plan within the basin or within the GMA would allow you to fine-tune it as necessary to react. Thank you. Okay. For, before you leave, Robert. Yes. Yeah. Are you proposing this for all customers, all classes of customers, or just M and I, or just farmers, or what? It is for uh, it's to initiate discussion for all classes. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else have questions? Anybody in the audience have questions? Okay. Excellent. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Um, anybody else have any comments on this uh, issue? Uh, Mike, I'm going to defer to Rob first. Mike, we haven't seen Rob in so long. This is a treat, you know. <laughs> and he's kind of insulting me before I step up. I need to do for beauty. I'm not sure what, what, what happened. Uh, Rob Saperstein for the City of Oxnard. I, I apologize. I was not able to be here for the August meeting, so I don't have uh, and didn't watch the tape. Realized too close to this meeting that there's a tape of it. There was, there was no August meeting. Uh, and there was well, July. You weren't here for July. July. I wasn't here for I July. I haven't seen you in a long time. Even we scarier. <laughs> A few general comments, and then I'm, I'm not quite sure how much of this will be making sausage in front of the board versus just developing a process. And now re that's really the first comment. I would encourage the board to set some principles and decide what process us folks might use to help influence the policy that might be brought back to the board rather than making the sausage with the board. And it gets a little laborsome this way. Um, but that's really the second piece that, that is crazy making, particularly for the great program in the city of Oxford, who's both trying to do planning for the great program and do planning for its own water supply integrity. The uncertainty is killing the city. And so it's important to set some principles in place and have folks in the community understand what's at stake, what's potentially moving pieces in the world of credits and what's not on the table because we've lived through now for the past year in the city adopting its general plan, comment letters from the GMA over the potential change in GMA policy over credits and that's difficult to deal with when here we are over a year later still dealing with some unstated uncertainty over how credits may change. And we simply can't plan with any integrity when all of that remains up in the air in some ways even more important for the great program and, and sort of feedback loop to Robert's presentation. His program doesn't work if you, through the great program, use of credits in that mix. So I shouldn't say it doesn't work. All it does is make the cost of the great program greater. So that gets fed back to whomever might use the water. So make it more concrete. Increase the cost of converting a acre foot of recycled water into the ability for the city to pump that water from the basin. If that cost goes up, that means the cost of recycled water delivered to ultimate end users has to go up. I don't think that's the board's intention. I don't think. If it is, be helpful to know that now rather than somewhere down the line once promises have been made, particularly to the agricultural community, over what that cost of water will be. Right now, we're having discussions about trying to make all that happen in the most cost-effective way. If Robert's plan impacted the cost of recycled water delivery, that would change the economics. So important. 
those either intended or unintended consequences are really useful to have sooner than later. Rob, could I interrupt you? Could you describe or explain how you perceive that the cost for recycled water would be increased with a program? Same question. Like that? Yeah, so, so the, the, the trying to keep it simple. We have, right now we're talking about making the great program water available for agricultural users at $250 an acre foot. That's the discussion with United, United right now, that that water would be delivered to either PTP system, maybe at some point, hopefully at some point in the relatively near future to the PV system and anybody else that is easily, can easily access that water. In exchange, the city gets $250 an acre foot plus the ability to pump that acre foot of water through either city wells or United wells somewhere within its system. Those economics are based on the current expectation that we pay a, a, a pump charge for the groundwater that's pumped out, not a surcharge on top of it. So if now there's a surcharge on top of repumping that converted recycled water, if that makes sense, it just changes the economics for the city. So the city is counting on using credits to make that $250 cost work. That's correct. So and say it state state even more simply. If the city is trying to get that recycled water to users that are in the most severely impacted areas, PV area, South Oxnard Plain, it makes the most sense. It's at the doorstep of the recycled water facility. But the city needs to convert that acre foot of recycled water delivered to an agricultural user into groundwater pump from four bay or a near four bay well. That's the way the I, program works. Okay, I, I think. Um, uh, Let's go back to the original presentation and what Brian said. When you're dealing with M&I pumpers, those pumpers do a storage pumpback program that's already approved by the GMA, and that pumpback program has protocol in it on what they can take out against what they put in. And um, I think that's a good policy. I I've, mentally, in my mind, unless somebody shows me evidence that it's the wrong position is, is that if somebody goes out and, in effect, invents new water and puts it in the ground, i.e. Kiegas, i.e. Oxnard, or others, then they do the similar thing. If they invent new water or clean up water, put it into the ground, or buy water and put it in the ground, essentially the ground becomes their bank and they should have the right to take it out. I don't see surcharges against that. I think that would be a fundamental change to what the GMA has been doing for the last 17 years when we first approved the first program. I think it's more than 17 years when we did the Cayugas program. Uh, my fear has always been that in the ag community we have numbers going up and we have incentives to potentially abuse the system. And so I see the, and as Brian said, we have protocol for the M&I users. We don't have protocol for the ag community. And Robert's suggestion is just another opportunity to look at it from a different angle. Robert's approach is a market-driven approach rather than a pure regulatory approach, which kind of mentally is where I was. But, but Robert has raised a, a great question. If we can do it with a little bit of market incentive in the process and accomplish the things we want, then, then I think what Rob is now saying is, is that if we assign this for further review, and whatever entity we assign it to, we need to give them some clear understanding of what the parameters, the basic parameters are that the board wants to accomplish this. Otherwise, the discussion just goes on forever and doesn't get accomplished. Mm -hmm. I, yes, ma'am. Right up here on his first slide, Robert said, will not impact storage credits. He was yes. talking about other credits, not yes. storage credits. So. And, and so, so where I'm re trying to reaffirm that, that and mentally, unless somebody can show me that we ought to impact storage credits to some extent, right now I, I haven't seen that evidence. Um, with regards to, and, and Rob is here, I said hi to him earlier, um, with regards to the uncertainty, I recognize the uncertainty, but there's going to be uncertainty going forward for a long time. There's uncertainty right now how much water the ag community will take. There's uncertainty how we're going to take it. So we're kind of part of that process. I think we need to do it sooner than later to give you as much certainty as we can. But um, it's, it's got to go through a, a process. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. 
We've, we've been talking about storage credits. Do I understand that when you came up, you weren't talking about storage credits, you were talking about wheeling credits, so to speak? Well, the You want theirs applied to yours? So a transfer of a credit? Uh, I'll, I'll you give them water, they give you a credit? Is that what I was understanding you saying? Or am I just sitting up here not having any idea what's going on? No, no I th I'll just be careful of terminology. That's all my only hesitation. The, in, in the GNA ordinance code, there are only two types of credits. They're either conservation credits or storage credits. Right. Sometimes people throw out the terminology in lieu credits. And in effect, that's what Cayugas does to some extent for its storage program. That's, in effect, what the city would do for the grade program. It, 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 instead of putting the recycled water in the ground and doing a pure storage program, it's delivering that water to an end user that reduces its use of groundwater, in effect, storing real water underground, not using real water underground, and the city would pump that out under, in a different location, the, the, the um, currency that the GMA uses is credits. We could give it any other name you want to give it, but the currency has always been a transfer of credits. And, and, and Director Mulhart is correct that that can be characterized as a storage program. Robert's mathematics didn't, although he said he's only intended to deal with conservation credits, when the mathematics are only about pumping of historical allocation and baseline allocation and anything above 10% above those numbers, you get hit by the surcharge. That doesn't distinguish between credits. It just looks at pumping. And what the city will, of Oxnard will, in fact, be doing is pumping in excess of its historical allocation and baseline allocation, but using storage credits for the buffer. Yeah. And that's all that needs to be and I, and I think And I think the, the again, rather than making sausage, the details yeah. of those subtleties, uh, if we decide to go forward with this, uh, are part of the task that we will assign to the appropriate people. Another way, just in simplistic terms, another way I look at it is you earn a credit by not pumping, or you can earn a credit by bringing in, quote, new water. Right. Storage program is new water. Those of us in the ag community, we earn it by not pumping. It's the number that's driving up on the non-pumping side that I personally have concerns about and what we have through staff and discussions, we can either cap it, we can more sunset it, we can do a whole bunch of things, or we can come up with some other me methodology, and that's what Robert presented. Right. Okay. Yeah, while we're on this discussion, I, I just want to, want to be clear because I'm not sure that I completely know how the great program is going to work here in, in credits and, and, and exchanges, but but certainly I want to make sure that there is no storage credit given in excess of the amount of new water created. That's correct. If there's not new water created, I don't want this arrangement to be created in such a way that it could be, you know. The, the, in simplistic terms, the city of Oxnard is going to process X amount of water. They're going to run it out of pipeline. That pipeline is either going to deliver it directly to the grower or they're going to put it into a settling pond and it'll percolate into the ground or at some point in time they could have a well and, and inject it into the ground. But it's water that's delivered out into the marketplace. For that acre foot, they want a credit so that they have the right to pull that water out at some future date on their facilities or United's facilities. So in effect, you've created a closed loop system. You were just asking for clarity in terms of what we're thinking. I just, you know, because an original question I had is why does the program need credits? Well, that's because the distinction wasn't being made between storage and it's a, And it's exactly the same thing that's going up, that's going on in the Las Postas Basin. Kiegas has bring, been bringing in excess state water, storing it in the ground, and at some future date, if an earthquake comes and the pipeline is broken, they want the ability to pull that water back out of the ground. And the methodology of managing that in that area and bringing that aquifer into balance, Kiegas through Henry, he's here, there, Henry, is leading um, the Las Postas Basin Group, users group, to come up with that methodology. And uh, John Matthews at PV is leading the group on the Oxnard Plain to come up with the methodology of how to bring that aquifer into balance. And all these little mechanisms are part of it. Um, 
the great program is part of it on the Oxnard Plain, Kiegas is part of it in the Las Posas Basin. In the meantime, you have independent pumpers. I, that's my new term. I'm an independent pumper. I have no other source of water other than my well, but I have a bunch of credits. I want to make sure that I don't get motivated to run on the bank of those. And we saw another alternative to that today. Uh, Rob, let me stop you for sake of time, if I may. And Mike wanted to speak. Oh, John. Let hey, John. Can I make okay. a very brief comment? So I'll, I'll, Will counsel defer I'll, to counsel? I'll, 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 be, I'll be quick. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wanted to remind the board, and this is, goes back to the uncertainty issue, remind the board, and some of the board members that are new may not know this, there already exist two GMA resolutions that authorize the city the credit exchange. One that says the city will get one acre foot of credit for each acre foot of recycled water directly delivered to an agricultural user. The city will also get one acre foot of credit for each acre foot of water physically put in the ground. The expectation is not to get more than one, but it changes the economics if the city is going to get less than one. And there's, there were statements made in the newspaper that maybe those resolutions are even at issue. It's important to know. I, either they are or they aren't. It's important to know if they're going to be. And, and the, the, um, the last piece is the city is certainly interested in and would love to take the lead on if there's a policy developed for m and folks. We think we can provide some assurance to the board that there won't be a run on the bank from the m and user's perspective. Credits, whether conservation or storage credits, are used simply for water supply planning purposes and integrity of water supplies. It's not intended to to develop a money-making economy for, for the cities in particular. So. Okay, thanks, Rob. John. Uh, I'm John Matthews with Pleasant Valley County Water District. First of all, I want to echo everything that Rob said. I think that the process here that you ought to concern yourself with today is what do you want to bring back to you? How do you want to, you know, what parameters do you want? What things do you want discussed? You're not agendized today, obviously, to make any changes. There's the, the Brown Act would not allow you to make any changes to the credits today. Uh, the other thing that prompted me to get up is I just want to make clear that, that I'm unclear on whether it's this conservation or storage credit. Uh, the, the easiest one to deal with, the two that we have here in the county that are easy to deal with, is Cayegas, which has their ASR program where they take water outside the county, bring it in, put it in the ground, storage credit. I'm not so sure that the Canal Creek project is what I would call a storage credit project. Uh, if you recall, uh, Director Mulhart is right. Uh, that's about 18 years ago that we negotiated that. And it was a four, basically almost a five-party agreement. Water was, connect, water was collected at the base of the canal grade. Uh, that's wastewater and natural flowing water in the creek. It was harvested by Camrosa. The credits were developed by Pleasant Valley not pumping their wells. So we were develop, developing conservation credits which then we transferred to Camarosa, which ended up with Cayegas, that ended up with United, so that the pumping would be shifted from the PV basin, which is an overdrafted basin, to the forebay. So that's how it operated. Mechanically and uh, politically, that project would not have been built had it not been for the credits. Cayegas, Camarosa, the city of Thousand Oaks, United, wouldn't have put the money in that project if there wasn't the ability to generate credits by Pleasant Valley by not pumping our wells and using those credits either by United or Oxnard to pump from the forebay. So in this particular case, credits were a good thing. Credits were a thing that made it able that we could get some supplemental water here. So I think when you're deliberating on what you want the, the committees or whatever you come up with, steering committees or the SAG or the TAG or whatever, you have to take a look at the good side of credits, too, because I think there are some positives that we're overlooking here. And I think sometimes we just try and fix things with a sledgehammer instead of fine-tuning them. And then we end up with the words of that famous American Lynn Mart, unintended consequences. Okay, thanks, John. Anybody else? Mike? Mike Solomon, United Water. Uh, just to follow up on the last two com uh, comments, I, I want to let the board know that we've convened a what we call a water managers group that meets at United once a month. It includes Jeff, 
Oxnard, uh, Pleasant Valley, City of Ventura, others, where we're discussing how we're going to most effectively use the great program, including how GMA credits would be used so that there's a benefit to the aquifer, but Oxnard gets what it needs for its huge investment in this. And so we've been trying to work together to make sure we stay within the ordinance, uh, the GMA ordinance, and City of Oxnard knows what the rules are because obviously they don't want to just build them and find out the rules get changed on them. And, and to answer the question of Director Bennett, one of the things that wasn't mentioned is what we've been talking about is a build out, the great program will produce about 28,000 acre feet of water. Oxnard only needs about 14,000. Now that number may change a little bit, but that's roughly what they're looking at is for their build out of their master plan and everything, 14. So what we net is about 14,000 acre feet of water being put in the right place and being pumped out of a place where we can more easily recharge. So there is that benefit. So we do have this water managers group. What we try to do is get the best, not the best, the minds of the people that are going to be involved all sitting in the room discussing it, the pros and cons, so we can work out the arrangements and work with Jeff so that we're in concert on the GMA ordinance and other requirements. And Oxygen knows where they can go. So okay. hopefully that helps. We'll call them the best, we'll call them the best minds. You can. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, um, the other thing in, in uh, Director Mohart, uh, I was going to represent what our board presented at the, discussed at the last, our last meeting. I didn't know if you wanted to present or you wanted me to. Okay. Um, at our board meeting a couple of weeks ago, we brought the issue of credits up because, as you'll remember, I got up and stood and said, hey, some things are broken. We need to fix it. But uh, we had some uh, issues we had to deal with. So we, wanted, we went to our board and said, uh, Brian Bondi did the presentation, and we said, what is this board's direction to their representative and for me to bring to you? And, and they, our board came up with a little different look at this issue. Number one, they really want to look more at, you know, we're building up all these credits. Maybe it's because the allocation's wrong. It was too high. Maybe that's part of the problem. We should look at that. They also talked about uh, the next thing is irrigation efficiency. You know, we're efficiently using water, but we're using more water than we can sustain. So even if we get the calculation right and everybody's efficient, it's still more water than we can afford to use. So we need to think about that. And that issue's on your... Uh, agenda today, but it's not just efficiently using, it's efficiently using what you can afford to efficiently use, if that makes sense. And then finally, and it's really been uh, hit on with uh, Robert Ranio's comments and others, is look at the loopholes for using credits so that people can't use the credits the way they really weren't intended to use and there's some monitoring going on. So those, from United's perspective, are the issues that should be addressed not just credits. And I, did I correctly represent all that? Okay. So from United standpoint, those are the priorities we should be looking at. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else on this item? Let me, let me, uh, uh, for the board, I, I think the task before us is to decide whether or not uh, we want to move this thing, move this issue on to some other review. Um, and so that's the first question. Do we want to table the issue? Is it done? Do we want to move it on for another review? And if we do want to move it on for a, a different review, uh, what is the format for that review? And we've heard suggestions on how it should be divided between possibly two entities of the SAG. Mike is now essentially suggesting that on the M&I side, there's already a group together that can deal with this on the AG side. Do we, do we create a, uh, um, a subgroup within SAG to look at it? And if so, what are the parameters and some time frame? I think that is kind of the questions before. So the first question is, do, you, do members want to pursue this issue, or is it dead on arrival? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that um, you know, uh, a, a paired study groups would be helpful. Uh, have you heard uh, Ms. Mulligan's uh, report that she gave yesterday to the m &I group, I believe, no. and this morning to the Las Posas? What was interesting, the potability standards, uh, the thing that's going to drive the cost of RO up and reclaiming water is sulfate and nitrate. 
both of which are tolerable on the ag side, but very intolerable on the potable side. And you're looking at a factor of about five, four, four to five times to drive it to the level where it's potable and can be put in the pipeline versus what it can be used to ag. And that brings me back to something I've been trying to bring to this group for several years now, is that all two gallons of water are not the same. And there should be some differential. If ag ends up being the destination of water which is too expensive to bring to a potable level, then ag should not be giving up an equal number of acre feet of credits for the water under our property that we have case law that, that we have a right to that water. And for us to give up equal number of credits for accepting degraded water or not yet re improved water enough to meet the potable standards, I think that's not an equitable situation. And I, I, I really would like to see it addressed Obviously, I think an SAG level would be the proper place, but it needs to be uh, somewhere looking at, at why should ag be continually giving up a credit and all credits are equal when the water we take is significantly poor. And the difference in improving that water was something on the ratio of $250 versus $1,100 a foot on this morning's presentation. Thank okay. you. Uh, Dave? I'm, um, before I heard the market-based approach, I was still pretty firmly planted uh, with the idea of, uh, as Rob said, credits really have ended up being a, a type of currency that made a lot of good things happen, and, and I think had the potential to continue to, to have a lot of cooperation to solve some of our issues, to ultimately get us out of this water overdraft that we have. Um, the thought that came to my mind as I heard the presentation was what about those folks or individuals or mutuals that spent money, upgraded systems, and therefore were able to conserve with the idea of having those credits on hand for that dry summer. Um, they spent the money already and now they're going to get charged again. Um, I do have questions, and I think the SAG is a is a is a good place. The uh, and we're going to hear some information about irrigation efficiency today, and I think that's going to be interesting, and that's going to be an important part of this discussion. And so, um, we probably need a lot of that information up front before we can even have a valid SAG discussion, in my mind, um, because that seems to be a, a something on everyone's mind that you know. There's issues with this irrigation efficiency program, and those questions of, of validity need to be answered. If there's a better way we can do that that you know solves the goals of the problem, then we probably need to come to that solution. So I, I'm I'm still not sure that uh, uh, a market-based approach for credits is a good thing. I, I'm, I'm still leaning that that's it's, it's counterproductive in my mind. Okay. Um, for clarification, are you is the issue today for you debt on arrival, or does the issue need to go forward with some additional work uh, and SAG as a, as a as a forum or some other forum? Well, I think I said it. I think it should go through SAG a little further. Okay. Um, the, the two groups idea is good, um, but I, I almost think it's better for the AG and the M and I folks to be in the same room. Okay, Steve. A couple of things. One, I definitely think we need to study this further. I think the, the potential for the credits to get us seriously into overdraft, serious overdraft year after year for a number of years is, is substantial, and I think. You know, we don't know where it's all going to go, but there are certainly some potentials for rising 
uh, water prices, imported, well, rising imported water prices, and 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 droughts that could have people cashing in their credits like crazy. Also, changes in technology and people that are sitting there using enormous amounts of water in very small areas. And so, there are lots of different ways that suddenly the demand for this water could could go through the roof, and people would start to work this. So, I think it's. I, I want to express a, a sense of pretty strong urgency that we can't not do something here. The question is trying to figure out what that is. One. Two, I'm not sure that um, I agree with your comment about lower quality water shouldn't have to have the same credit because if your problem is overdraft, your problem is overdraft. Uh, and um, you know, if, 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 if you're getting water and not giving up at least uh, a credit to take that water out of there, uh, I could see that continuing to, to, to create a, an overdraft problem, which, which I think we have out there. I thought that um, uh, it'll come up during the IE, but I thought that Mike Solomon's comment about it's one thing if you're efficient, but if everybody's efficient and we're still in significant overdraft, we've got a problem you know, still that, that is out there. So the final thing that I would say, um, appreciate the market um, uh, ideas uh, as much as we can be able to create the proper incentives and disincentives um, uh, we should do that in the marketplace has, has always been the, the best way to do that if you can but we have to recognize this is the interaction between the marketplace and a regulatory agency and so uh, I would strongly want to suggest that if we did this we, for this interaction between the marketplace and regulatory agency, as, as you said, well, you know, we could do this for three years, and if we see that the rates have really changed, you know, we could sit there and, you know, change what we're doing. I would be much more comfortable saying, using something to determine what is the market price and setting our credit surcharge as a percentage of that or, you know, something, so that as the market changed, it automatically changed. And we're not sitting here as a regulatory agency because if it's three years before we revisit, you could have this disincentive, you know, that you had built in there uh, to, to use the credit suddenly become an enormous incentive to use the credit because the market changed faster than we could change. Whether we can create that, but I would I would strongly uh, advocate for trying to keep ourselves as linked. If if we're going to rely on the market, then let's stay linked to it as much as possible. Okay, Charlotte. Um, first of all, to answer your question, yes, I think we need to move forward with this. Uh, I agree with what Dave said. I agree with what Steve said. Um, as far as what uh, Rob came up and, and talked about with regard to Oxnard, I understand their need for a speedy decision. Uh, but I, And I do recognize we've been moving a little faster lately, but I do also remember that when we were discussing revising our ordinance code. I was here for three years that we discussed it. I was gone for four years, and I came back, and I was here two years before we actually got the thing done. So uh, I, I'm not sure you, that you're going to get the answer as uh, quickly as you'd like it. In the meantime, you do have your two resolutions. And uh, and he was part of that process that took four years, five years, six years. Well, I didn't notice he talked a long time. <laughs> Um, we also have to remember that we need to, we do need to move forward and we need to push this along because we have a situation uh, that could get worse uh, with, and I think that Supervisor Flynn put it in, the, same, in the, the best terms it could possibly be. People are taking the water out and sending them out in little red water balloons. And uh, that's a problem that, that uh, we need to address as to where the people who are producing all the little red water balloons get their water and how they get it and if they're going to be using somebody else's credits and the credits will be sold. And that can create a big problem for us. So we need to move forward. We need to move forward uh, not with haste but as quickly as we can and still get the uh, – everybody's ideas hashed out. I think we need to keep Robert's ideas in and at least discuss them. And at this point, we shouldn't say we don't want it discussed further. Uh, so I think that the uh, manager's group is fine. I heard managers on the west part of our area uh, mention I'd like all the managers to be in the group if they're not. And maybe it was just a few managers who were named and the rest were left out. But uh, I think that all the uh, the manager should be in, but uh, otherwise I think we need to move forward. Okay. 
Um, all right, so we're, we're going to move forward uh, and move this issue on to uh, uh, some kind of protocol. Um, I, I think we have um, three options that are available to us. One option is, is that we don't have two groups. We have one group where uh, M&I folks and ag folks are together and so that everybody gets a chance to see what everybody is doing and get input. But it's probably going to have to be a selected group, I mean a, a subgroup of SAG, so we are we're forcing the issue that we get enough ag representation because if that's been a complaint, we need to create a forum where we can get ag representation. That's one possibility. One group with ag members, M and I members, and we hash this thing out as quickly as we can so we don't have to repeat ourselves. That's one alternative. Another alternative is is you have two SAG groups, independent, one M and I and one ag. Um, and they deal with their own respective problems. And the third option is um, that we play off of the M&I managers group and make sure that that is sufficiently constituted to represent the M&I users. But it's an established group and they have been meeting for some time and it was really put together, frankly, to expedite the issue of, uh, uh, of the great program and I think it's been working uh, fairly well. Um, and then have a separate ag group. So you can have one group, subgroup of SAG dealing with this issue, ag and m &I. A second option would be an independent subgroup of m &I and an independent subgroup of ag. Or the third option is the manager's group reconstituted or modified slightly to meet the goals and objectives and then an ag group. What would you guys like? What would you folks think would work best? Is there a fourth option? <laughs> Henry. Uh, Henry Gromlich, Cayugas Municipal Water District. Uh, Dr. Kelly referred to a presentation today at the Las Posas Users Group in which both ag and m &I interests were represented. And uh, the discussion was quite spirited and I, I would advocate your board to consider bringing both parties, both AG and M&I together to deal with the credit issue. Uh, there are various options that can only be addressed by both parties understanding how the other party is approaching the particular issue. And while it varies depending on the part of the GMA you're in, in our particular backyard uh, on the Las Posas and Cayugas watershed, there are really quite uh, quite interwoven. Uh, some of the groundwater issues that the city of Camarillo is dealing with is very pertinent to how groundwater credits by the ag community are dealt with. Similarly, the Las Posas Users uh, Group has found that the ASR project and how it operates very much depends on how the ag interests are protected and uh, water quality is dealt with in that. So I would, I would encourage you to, to constitute a SAG, SAG group, but uh, certainly allow in parallel the water managers group to consider to deal with this issue as it relates from their perspective. Okay, so you're, you're, you're voting for, your recommendation is option three? One. I thought it was one group. One. Yeah, one group, but let the, I, I, I don't. I don't think you should. You know, this this isn't a position okay. where your board should be limiting other groups. Okay. Okay. From coming right. up with one group, ideas. but but not limit the uh, managers group. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Members. Uh, uh, Dave. I, I would suggest that maybe even Henry bring that up as an agenda item for the next user group meeting. It's a. It's a. Like you said, you've got. Uh, uh, District 19 uh, and 9 and 1 presented there. Uh, it's, a, it's a very wide range of interests that show up, and it's 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 one particularly good forum, I think, where All right, well that, people know the dates of those meetings. They know when they are. They they show up. Which, of the three options that I laid laid out, which one do you want to go with? So that would be a number one, I guess. Okay. All but uh, but really, I'm proposing it as a subgroup of SAG and not necessarily a subgroup of the Las Posas Users Group. They're obviously members of Las Posas User Group that would go to that. 
but we need to do it under the, I think, under the SAG banner. We duplicate it because you've got to, you have to reach some folks on the western Oxnard Plain to make it work. So. Then let's just schedule a SAG meeting and yeah. and let some of these various groups talk about it amongst themselves and set this meeting out a, a, yeah. a month or two ahead and then they can come together and send representatives. Okay. In a All big right. room. <laughs> big right, room, so, no uh, sticks. I'm. Um, <laughs> Dave uh, likes option one. Mike. The problem I face with my constituency is that most of them don't get paid to be at the meetings. And so it's a quite a bit harder in the small pumpers to get representatives to it all. So that presents a real dilemma to me. But, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll see what I can do. I tried to get everybody there. It might okay. be considered future pay if it's going to cost them a lot if they don't come. <laughs> uh, so you're okay uh, with one? Option one. I, yeah, I think so. As long as we have it organized in such a way that we have a forum where um, members of the small pumpers, uh, you know, are able to attend and be on equal footing. Okay. So, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, back to what uh, Supervisor Bennett was commenting back a minute ago. The, the problem Steve, that I see is um, much of the reclaimed water is going to be subject to Title 22. And you know how, what you can do with it is not necessarily universal, and so it, there, there's problems associated with it. And, and one of it is delivery system. Unless we dual system the county, we're going to have to use some existing ag delivery systems to be able to use it, and that in turn keeps us from using other water which would be more appropriate for human consumption. And that's where I See, the ultimate goal would be that people need one level to drink and plants need another level to drink. Okay. Uh, Steve, with regards to the options. Uh, 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 option one, and the only other thing I want to mention as we're going forward with this is people talked about the fact that the way the credits have been set up, you've been able to do some creative things in the past, and I would offer if you set up a really good credit system that has good incentives and disincentives, then that would allow us to say, because for this project, we're going to exempt you from that uh, so that we can do these other Could that actually create more incentives for people to use, you know, be, be creative is what I'd hope. But option one for sure, because I think the conflicting interests are the best way to try to check each other. Okay. Charlotte? Option one is one group, right? With yes. Some That's it. Okay. Um, option one, uh, I think, uh, works. You know, when you listen to our discussion here, and, you know, your, your comment, Dave, that, you know, people earn, you know, I, I earned the conservation credits that I have by not pumping. And now you're telling me if I have to use them, I've got to pay a surcharge. Now you've disincentivized me. I think that's a valid question. But I think if we are creative in our solution, we could say something to the effect that says, for the, f for the first set of credits equal to two times your annual pumping, there is no surcharge. It's when you exceed two times, when you start pulling credits that are beyond, once you reduce your credit bank of those credits that were earned umpteen years ago, so you could, you could post date it with all kinds of factors that basically say the first 200 acre feet of credits that I have to burn uh, from what I have beginning today, um, there is no surcharge because I earned it under a different program. But going forward, I understand that there is a new program going forward, and that's, that could be all part of the process to manage it. In terms of using credits to do good things, even in the ordinance, we spent, uh, as John and Rob will tell you, and Steve, we, we spent a long time coming up with some convoluted wording that essentially says, if it's part of a water management program that is designed to enhance and blah, 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 then we can use credits as part of the vehicle. That's in the ordinance now. And because that language is in the ordinance, ordinance we're able to do a lot of things we're doing now. So I think that if we go to one group and the group understands the job is to make the system better, uh, not necessarily rewrite all the rules, because I think there's a lot of good rules that have allowed the credits to work in the future. There are ways to deal with the market. You could go to the market program after a certain tier. You could do all kinds of things. And I think that the one group is the forum to have that discussion. So I would agree with you. Jeff. And Lynn, that's yeah. one more. And I agree with you. That's one particular option. And I think another option, which maybe United was thinking about, is in terms of loopholes, is 
some of the loopholes, I think, are in our current ordinance. Yeah. And perhaps if we are able to address in an ordinance, uh, in our or existing ordinance with an improvement that somehow doesn't make this marketing or this of credits themselves, the, the selling, the creating, a, a giving yeah, them a price uh, tag. And I'm, I'm really glad you said that because it, 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 I had had that in the back of my mind and I forgot about it. My fear is is that the credits could at some point in time become an unintended currency that drives the marketplace beyond our control. If in the credit review we recognize we don't want a market program, we don't want we don't want any of that, but we discovered we have three loopholes and we come up with wording to cover those loopholes, I'm happy. It solves the long term problem. So in the in the review process, I believe it's an open checkbook if you want to make sure that the credit program does not come back and bite us at some point in the future, does not restrict the M&I folks from doing these large public works that need to be done, that we use the credits to incentivize people to look for new sources of water, but to disincentivize the credits to become some form of hidden currency that we can never get back into the bottom. So anyway. And, and perhaps you, it's appropriate that staff investigate that, those yeah. so-called loopholes. What I bring those to the meeting. Jeff, uh, you've heard the discussion. What I would ask you to do, and I am sensitive to the city of Oxnard's time frame and all the things they're doing. Um, what I would ask you to do is try to put together a um, a protocol or a format of who you think ought to be at this meeting. Schedule a meeting between now and the next board meeting and try as best we can to get good ag M&I um, um, independent um, mutuals and the like get a good representation have your first meeting it's under SAG so between you and Mike you're you're managing this thing and see if at that first meeting you can define the objectives define the parameters and map out going forward the next set of meetings and who that group is I don't, I don't want to lose a month in the process. I think the next SAG meeting, you could, you could bring this issue up, figure out the protocol, how you want to structure it, where you want the meetings, how many meetings you want, and then be able to report to us at the next board meeting that you had the meeting, here's the list of group people that were there, uh, here's the feedback we got, and here's how the meeting schedule is going to go forward, and uh, maybe we can push this ball down the road. Does that, does that make sense? We can do that. I did hear one of your board members suggest that we wait a bit uh, so that they have a chance to get the word out to the various uh, interested parties. Um, if, and uh, that may not give them enough time. Um, that would be a question. Um, but okay. we can certainly get it before the next board meeting. The other thing I would offer is that um, we'd be willing to come to any of those interested party groups, make a credit presentation to try to describe what we think the problems are so that they're prepared for the SAG meeting when they come. I don't think the purpose of this meeting in two or three weeks is to necessarily answer the credit issue, but to begin the process of establishing the credit subcommittee and how it will constitute. And at least by having that meeting, you'll, you'll be able to tell your constituents you ought to go to at least that meeting and find out what we're proposing. But and maybe then, going for him to take his program to the various groups would be a good start. Well, any any of those combinations to move it forward I think is appropriate. I'm not sure I agree with the issue that we ought to wait to see what the efficiency um, study, we're going to hear from the doctor today about what they came up with. I believe they run in parallel. I think you can do these in parallel. Um, and if you one waits for the other, we'll never get it done. And I don't want to have Charlotte yell at me in nine years that we didn't get this problem solved. So if right. I'm even here in nine years, which I'm not planning on being here in nine years. I'm not either. Jeez <laughs> Louise. Okay. Are we, you, yeah, uh, we'll reach out to the community and we'll get the meeting set up um, okay. soon. Are you, are you guys, folks, okay with that direction to staff? Yes. I'll get the word out of the farm to me tomorrow. Okay. All right. So that, that'll be the direction. Anybody else have any comments on that? That'll be the direction. All right. Thank you, Robert, for a nice presentation. Okay. Let's go to number six. Landing. Oh, here it comes.
Good afternoon, Chair Molhart, board members, members of the audience, Gerhard Hubner for the record, Watershed Protection District. It's my uh, pleasure to present item number six, which is a proposed resolution 2010-6, uh, our groundwater supply enhancement assistance program and proposed criteria. As let you me, recall, let, yeah, let me. I'm sure. Let me ask uh, as as part of my opening statement. Let me ask up front. Dr. Stiles, um, how long do you think uh, we've got some members that have to leave at four o'clock? And it's important that we hear what you. And I want to give you enough time. How long do you think you? And we need to hear everything he has to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I promised Rick I would keep it uh, within twenty minutes. Okay, so if I if we al if we allocate at least thirty minutes, we're well within your time frame. Okay. All right. Chair, I, you know, I might recommend that we move this item later. Um, All right. Well, let given me, we've got such a huge budget surplus, we may want to revisit. All right. Well, let me let me do this to, again. I, as I indicated to staff, I'm sensitive to the clock because of the things we have on here. Why, why don't we do this? Let me ask a couple of questions. Did all the members get a chance to read uh, the staff uh, discussion and report that was a, given in the agenda packet and get a chance to read through the um, resolution. Yes. Okay. Everybody got a chance to do that. All right. It's consistent with what we talked about at previous meetings. Staff has responded to the fact that we have some money. One of the discussions we had is, and we've heard it from our constituents, that we ought to put this money to some kind of use other than just holding meetings. And I think staff has responded to it. So I don't... I. Um, so, Gerhard, what I'm, what I'm pushing at is I don't think we need to be sold on it. I think we're there. Great. So let me kind of cut to um, some discussion about um, what I read, and then I'll allow other members to make their comments, and then I'll let the audience make the comments, and sure. we'll get to the discussion element so that we're done by uh, no later than, say, 3.20, and that gives us 40 minutes for Dr. Stiles, which I think is – one of the critical issues that we've been wanting to hear about for a long Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Okay, and I. And could we move him up in front of item eight? Yes, we'll do. Well, we're, as I indicated to Gerard, we're going to. I'm going to ask you the same question. Did you get to read the financial report? And if you're all happy, uh, Gerard will be done because I'm I'm racing well, through. Would there be any it. objection to just having him do it and then Gerard afterwards? Okay. Well, let. <laughs> oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, we'll move that one up here. So Thank let me. You. All right. So let's go to item six here. Here's some of my comments. The general guidelines. First of all, I'm okay with the concept. It's consistent with what we've talked about. I'm okay on page uh, two of four uh, in the staff's report that the project be completed within three years. I'm okay if it goes out four years. I'm three years for a project is pretty tough. So even okay. four years. Okay. okay. With the potential of one year extension with board approval, that gives a potential of five years in knowing how public works issues go around here, five years is not forever. <laughs> okay. um, I do not agree with the maximum funding level of 250. I would drive the funding level down to $100,000. I would rather have more seed, I'd, have, I'd rather have more seed projects going than one big mm -hmm. project out there. And I'd also condition it on it, it's matching funds. The most we will fund is $100,000. Uh, we will match the cost of the project uh, not to ex up to a matching limit of $100,000. I believe that if somebody comes to us with a project and says, hey, I think this is a good idea, I want them to have a dog in the fight. I want them to have a stake in it. And that's consistent with the same grants we get from all kinds of people that it's matching funds. And I'll just put a cap at $100,000. That potentially is a $200,000 grant to begin the process of looking at an issue. And I think you can do a lot of looking for $200,000 on the kinds of things you need to look at. What about the question in kind? Okay, or in kind, however you want to do it. Well, I, I, yeah, I'm not, I, do we want to put a maximum on the in kind, you know, 50000 oh. of an in kind? Uh, okay. Otherwise, for, for, for their matching? For or? their match. Right. I don't, my answer to that is I don't know how other grant programs work, but there are grant programs uh, out there that have matching funds or in kind and limits. Mm -hmm. I would put that in there. I just don't want to hand out $250,000 no. to somebody that says, hey, this is a great idea, and pfft, 
it's it's really uh, picking up. I think a hundred thousand. If we're going to go down to a hundred thousand, I think it should be real money. Yeah, that, uh, yeah I, I wasn't saying in kind because I was advocating for it. I would want to be cautious to. If okay. it's a hundred percent match in kind, then they may not and have I'm, as much skin. And on. I'm and I'm flexible on however you want to write it. I want to limit so I can do more of them, mm -hmm. and I want them to have some money into the equation. Okay. And then. Um, the rest of it, total amount available, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with the November cutoff. If you get a November cutoff, the earliest that the board can look at the issue is January of the following year. That our thought was because we have the board meeting, typically we have a December yes. board meeting, and then the next one is in January. And I'm okay with that. Good. Okay. The question then becomes, if they come up with a project and it takes the board one or two months to look at it, where are we in our budget cycle so that we know the funds we have going forward or the funds we have left for that year? So it may be that November is not the right time frame. I think what you need to do is have it such that whatever project comes before us, you give us a month or two months, staff a month to look at it, and the board a month or two months to look at it so that it falls into a budget cycle that we actually can give to Gerard and he can track so we're not out of cycle with money going out the door on mm -hmm. projects that I don't know where they fall. And they're okay. going to want it in their budget cycle. And they're going to want it in their budget cycle. And I recognize all our budget cycles are not necessarily the same, but then, it is what it is. Then maybe it wants to be at the beginning of our budget cycle. How, however you want to back yeah. it up. July. So that at the beginning of our budget cycle, boom, the money is paid. Mm -hmm. But the approval process can happen before the budget cycle so that going up into the budget for the year, Gerard can come to us and say, for this year, we've had no request for matching funds. Okay, that changes our, you know, it has an impact on our budget. Or Gerard can say, hey, we've had 10 applications for a pool of a half a million dollars at $100,000 limits. Five of those are going to make the cut at most, or none are going to make the cut at, right. at the worst. We need to know that before we go into a budget cycle. So I would change the time frame. Huh? And, then, um, and then the rest of it, dealing with each project proponent submitted the following, I'm okay with the list, and you can put caveat, or uh, as specifically requested by staff, I'd throw it in there. There may be a specific, depending on the nature of the project, you may have a specific kind of thing that you need as part of the application. I don't know. Leave yourself a wiggle room. Those are the those are the changes I would make to the uh, proposal. So, who wants to go after that? Dave, I started over there last. I, I think Charlotte. That, you go ahead, Charlotte. Charlotte. Sure. Yeah. Oh, I, I, if somebody made a motion, I could vote to yes. Okay, you're okay with that. I'm Please. okay with what you said, but I think it needs to be. Uh, if we're going to go to a hundred thousand dollars, I think it needs to be hard money and not in kind. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to clarify, just I, I don't mind some in kind. I just wouldn't want to be 100% in kind. Uh, then there's some sense of people putting up some, some of their own cash. And as you talked about, I liked what you were saying about the budget, where it fits in the budget cycle. Um, I think partially with them having a November 30th, if we, even if we said for the annually we're going to have these things normally be due, let's say, April 1, you know, because that would fit with a July 1 budget cycle pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, we might still want to have these start November 30th, okay. just so yeah. we just so we could kind of practice, kind of work out the bugs before we locked in all the details. But I, and I'm okay with that. I'm okay with the November, with the caveat: the funding will not commence until the beginning of the budget cycle. So we deal with budget. the following budget. We'll deal with these issues on an annual basis, and not constantly throughout the year. I, I think that's probably better because we may actually have in any given year some competing ones and we're going to have to make some tough decisions. So, Mike. Uh, as you read discuss it, I agree completely. Okay. Dave. I, I still like the idea of a maximum of 250 just because there's, with the way these projects go anymore, these budgets are, are very large and, and there's a lot to do just in terms of planning and, and uh, but I do like the idea of, of matching funds and and if there are a majority of them being uh, hard cash matching, that makes sense too. I don't know what that percentage is, but no less than 50, no, I don't know, 60% hard cash, I don't know. But I think we ought to reserve the option to, if a really good project comes along that's big, 
we might want to fund it to the entire 250. Um, I, I go, Maybe my, it overweighs all the other applications and its importance. Um, we have we, that flexibility that way. Yeah. The reason I the reason I went to a hundred thousand dollars is because. Because I believe that our role at the GMA ought to be the seed money that gets people thinking about ideas. And I think you can spend $200,000 on seed money on an idea and do a preliminary analysis to see if it's even worth the next big chunk of change you have to pay. Given the fact that we can't build structures, we can't manage structures, we don't buy, we don't do any of that. What we really do is we regulate, which everybody hates to hear, but that's the truth, and we manage the aquifer. So if somebody comes up with an idea, then it may be a, and I don't think we need an idea that's already been chewed on for five years per se, that's already now a half a million dollar idea or a hundred a million dollar idea and we're the funding source for it. I'm not sure that's, that's, that's why I went down on the number. It, it may in fact be that the board decides to to divvy it up in, in smaller increments. But like I say, I, I think to pigeonhole ourselves to the 100 when a large project that, you know, we all know the size of the dollars involved in some of these projects. These recycled water projects are in the multi millions, and 200,000 doesn't cover the consultant to draw a few plans. I mean, uh, right. it's. I think we ought to just keep things a little bit. We can more always open. lower it during any particular year. A board could always decide to. You know, divvied up in whatever way it saw fit. We can always raise it, too. Now, I mean, as we're studying, if we got several good ones, it, sa it says a maximum of. We don't have to give them. All right, so what do you guys want to do? Well, I gave you my ideas. <laughs> you want to stay with some, some number between? Uh, okay. I'm at 100. Dave's at 250. I like my idea. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't care. I don't care. Charlie, give me a number. I'll, I'll go with the 250. Dave talked me into it. Okay. Steve. Well, I'd like to see how many applications come in. I'm not certain. If and it's a maximum a of. If we get a lot of applications, I would like to keep it down so that we have a lot of good ideas uh, germinating out there. So, Mr. Like Chairman, if, we, if we only get two or three applications, we can raise it. But in my opinion, if you took your original suggestion and have it a starter money would be 100000 then. If you don't get enough to cover the whole thing, you could raise it and lump it back into a bigger amount. Okay. So I'm what only offer that's, I think it's probably a little hard for people doing the application. I mean, you're not going to apply, you know. I mean, you may decide you're not going to go for it because you, you don't have the, you know. If, if you don't know that you can get $250,000, right? I guess I would lean a little bit to the two fifty dollars with with the idea that you've expressed the interest to try to have lots of them, I would lean towards them. People should know if we get a lot of good ideas, so I would cut ten, them down. If you had ten worthy applicants, how many would you use? Well, I think the idea of limiting ourselves to five hundred thousand dollars. If they're, I mean, it depends on how good they are. There may be one that you'd say, "Hey, this one's worth two fifty, and four of them are worth a hundred, even though they all want two fifty. Or some of them may not be requesting two fifty. Since they have seen all those scenarios and grant programs that I managed. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> so I take, well, I, take I, I join, I don't join Charlotte and Dave and go to 250. Oh, okay. We're there. Break the time. Rob, Rob said we weren't going to make sausage and we're making sausage. I like it. <laughs> in the interest of time, okay. I'm going to propose a motion just as right, it's written it. in the packet. There you go. Oh, no, no, no. No, I wouldn't agree to that. With four years? I would. Uh, yeah, I won't agree to that because the packet does not include matching funds. Okay. So, so this I, is in the packet, think, changing number one to four years. Okay. With a potential for one year. Uh, number two. This is under the general guidelines. Number two is a maximum of two hundred and fifty thousand with a matching fund of uh, fifty percent. No, I, I I would go higher than that. <laughs> One for one? You said you didn't want it to be... No, matching. For matching. Cash. Matching I, funds, it. not in kind, matching funds. If somebody, if somebody... If somebody and that's is one of the applying for 250, they have to have matching funds of... Or they have to have funds of 250 is what you yes. want? Okay, fine. 
Okay. I'm easy on that one. All right. Uh, available is half a million a year, and then adjust the application if necessary so that it goes into a, our budget cycle. We won't approve it until it's in our budget cycle so that we have a chance to actually look at it within the budget. We're going to be taking applications by November 30th of each year, and that would be for funds that will be available in the following budget year. There you go. Fiscal year. Uh, right. Okay. I, I would just offer something that like said the November 30th. I was thinking of getting a few in early to see what it was like and then, then starting again for like an April 1. Uh, if we're saying this, uh, I don't know why we would j jam everybody to come in for November 30th. We're not going to fund till July 1. We ought to. We, I think we should move back. Um, July 1 is when we start our fiscal year, right? Right. Yes. In terms next of our budget how about, year. How about the application should be in by January 30th? Uh, at least okay. guys, more time between now and okay. then. Okay. Yeah, listen, if straight. you're going, if if people can know that they can get up to a half a million dollar, a, a quarter of a million dollars. They can get it in fast. Well, well, first of all, we need to make sure that our, that staff has the time to really review this project. So we. I think November 30th is a valid time, especially for the first one. I'm fine. Okay, I'm okay with November 30th. Let's go with November 30th. We can always change it. You guys okay with that? All right. With those changes, can we make those changes, verbal changes, and approve resolution 2010-6 uh, with those changes uh, noted? Yes. Okay. And there so, was one other change, Chairman O'Hart. Yes. Uh, as you also said, or, spe or specifically requested by staff in terms of yes. the submittal. Yes. In terms of the seven, you're going to add eight or any specific um, uh, request by staff. Yes. Okay. All right. With those changes, can I have a motion? Your motion is to adopt ordinance or resolution 2010-6. Is that correct with yes. those changes? That's a motion. Second. Second. Any discussion? All, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, so moved. All right. Thank Let's you. do this. Um, okay. All right. I, item, the two items that we need to deal with are item seven mm -hmm. and item nine. How long is it going to take to deal with item seven? Uh, for my presentation, be relatively quick. Okay, do it. Do it very quickly. Yeah, but how long are we going to talk about it? <laughs> yeah, well, that's the next. Week. <laughs> no, I, I got I want to stay in the order. We didn't. We told people we were going to change the agenda. Okay, let's do this quickly. Okay, uh, Gerhard Huebner again presenting item number seven. Um, they can bring that presentation up. I'd appreciate it. But I'm going to start. Uh, background. Recently, we learned that our agency staff geologists will be on extended leave for two months or more. As you know, that position represents a significant portion of our core staff responsibilities. I'm doing the evaluation as the, the manager of the division and some of the staffing of the GMA. I looked at various things, including um, the universe of our work plan task assignments, then I look towards uh, what the availability of internal WPD staff, uh, extra help or former groundwater staff that might be available, retired annuitants. Lastly, then went to the external help and the contract, which is the proposal you see before you. Um, as you know, key agency work plan staff are not readily or easily reassigned without that person. This agency has some unique nuances in terms of its ordinances and its allocation systems, as you've heard many times. So, therefore, we, uh, we did contract the source group primarily because they have the unique ability to assist us in the interim, the short term. Um, as you know, Mr. Christian Labor, who is in the audience here today, was one of our uh, employees, former staff geologists from 2006 to 2008. Mr. Labor, as proposed, would work with agency staff on a time and materials contract. Essentially, he would be tasked by us specifically uh, for approximately 16 hours a week over the next several months. We provide him with space, office, phone. Um, he would have the added benefit of being able to work with agency staff, with Sheila, their database, and other staff. And the cost of the contract would be partially offset by the cost savings achieved by the staff resources, essentially uh, our staff geologists not being here. And we've calculated that to be about 40000 
scope of the services, we again looked at the work plan, lined it up with the work plan, uh, agency compliance program, that we looked at the various other tasks. We did reassign some tasks to various other staff, but these, as you can see in the staff uh, board letter, there was five or four things in order of priority. Our agency compliance program, meter calibration, unreported wells, and unpaid pump surcharges. The other one that's uh, uh, very important, we do get a fair amount of requests for allocation credit determinations, requests for adjustments, reviewing those, making appropriate determinations. They do take some time. They all have, again, their little nuances. Well, we have our annual report. We uh, put that together usually in the fall um, and, and have that ready by the January of the following year. Uh, we also have identified basin boundary determinations. But we haven't been able to do as much work as we would like, do other priorities, um, and then additional tasks, consultant assistance as needed. So in conclusion, some of our conclusions, currently we do not have the sufficient technical staff and workforce capacity to meet some of our existing work plan objectives, both in the uh, core and additional tasks. Uh, we believe outsourcing some of those technical assignments but with a short interim period is prudent, no more than six months, until a return of our normal staffing level. Uh, the source group is available. Mr. Christian Label is available and to assist us on a temporary and intermittent basis. Uh, we've proposed $50,000 as a proposed contract not to exceed based upon the consultant's per rate hour at 360 hours, six months, diamond materials contract. We have the option of not using the contract if our staff geologist returns earlier or if the services are not needed. Okay. Uh, right. And that's our recommendation. Again, the, the work would be allocated, adjusted on a task basis um, tied to the agency's work. Okay. I have a question, Ger Gerhard. Yeah. Uh, so do you, you propose that uh, there may be times when you might need Mr. Labor more and sometimes when you may need him less? And you would adjust his time accordingly? Or yes. Or is it a set? Yeah. He's, he essentially, we've indicated he might have as much as 16 hours, two days a week. But if we don't need him, it would be less. In some cases, I don't think it would be more than 16 hours, uh, unless they would bring in uh, perhaps some of the resources that they have, other staff that they have at, at their consultant company. But primarily, we're looking to Mr. Labor. But, there, but there's a, a total dollar limit of $50,000, yes. period. Right. That seems reasonable, because some okay. of the things you've listed here don't seem to be necessarily geologist-type work, and perhaps can be uh, done by different staff. Okay. Okay. So, ma ma okay. Mr. Chairman, if I just might, just a slight technical on the recommendations. If your board does desire to approve this, I would request that you specify that the source of this funding will be from year-end fund balance carried over from fiscal 910. Okay. Thank you, Gerard. Right, yeah. right. that. Charlotte has made a motion. And that was included. In the and that was included in the motion. A second. And a second. Any other discussion from anybody? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, so moved. All right. Thank you. Chris gets to go to work again. <laughs> again, or here at least. Thanks. Okay. Um, item number eight, uh, you have, it's an informational item. You have the uh, budget. Uh, Gerard uh, goes to great length to give us a beautiful and detailed analysis. Do you have any specific questions? Move to receive and file. Okay. I have a motion to receive and file. Second. And a second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing? Not so, uh, so moved. Okay. All right. Dr. Stiles, who's going to, uh, Rick? Oh, there he is. Could we have item number nine, the wrong please? One. That's the budget. Mm -hmm. 
Good afternoon, Chair Mallhart, members of the board. For the record, my name is Rick Virgutz, and uh, I'll be presenting item number nine today, and Dr. Stiles also has a presentation uh, with slides of his own. I think he indicated it would take about 20 minutes to go through those. What I thought I would do is just quickly summarize the report and then turn it over to Dr. Okay. Stiles. Yeah, because I, as I just dawned on me, we have to go to closed session, too, as well, so. Okay. Um, uh, I'll be well, let me add. Just Are you to going to tell us what he's going to say? Well, well, I can I can summarize what the report did, or if you'd like, we well, can let me turn let me because Dave just said. It. Let me ask: the members get a chance to read staff's information. We have not seen the report, okay, because it was not included unless you looked at it online, and I didn't get a chance to look at. It. So, give us a quick summary, and then we'll hear from Dr. Stiles. Let's do that. Okay. Well, uh, what I'll do is is just skip over. Um, some slides here. Yeah. Um, one acknowledgments: Dr. Faber did conduct the 25 grower interviews, which was important for us. Uh, David Peak of Investment Signals was also very helpful dealing with uh, Dr. Stiles' group, and it was able to help them understand the, some of the historical data and how things have been calculated, and that was real important for for this study. And Dr. Schwankel did review the report. And we expect he'll be more involved in the in the future. Uh, and Dr. Stiles and Faber and Schwankel have all signed the report that uh, Dr. Stiles will be presenting to you today. And uh, so this will be the first of two reports. This report deals with plant required water. The next report will cover things that um, are related to crop management regarding to regarding water needed for leaching, frost protection, Santa Ana winds, those types of things. So the purpose of today's report is just to synthesize the existing information and describe where we're doing well, where we need to improve, and what Dr. Stiles' analysis of plant required water is. The second report will have more specific recommendations about how to improve the program and how to um, I guess add in additional water needed for salt leaching and things of that nature. And uh, I think Dr. Stiles will be going through these. So I think what I'd like to do is just quickly go through them. Uh, there, there were findings on the weather stations. Some of the data is poor from 2007 prior. Uh, site conditions aren't quite correct. Uh, regarding distribution of evapotranspiration values, Dr. Stiles is rep recommending that we use three weather zones, a coastal zone, a mid zone, and an inland zone, that we abandon one or two weather stations and improve our, our data quality from the weather stations. Regarding the crop evapotranspiration modeling, the agency currently lists uh, allowed water for five crop types. Dr. Stiles is recommending we bump that up to 21. And I think that probably came out of uh, Dr. Faber's interviews with the growers, but I'm not sure. Um, there's some issues with effective precipitation. There's a lot of variability based on that, and that'll be looked at in the second report. Uh, there was a comparison made to the GMA allowed water to the modeled crop of apotranspiration. Uh, they're different. That's to be expected. And uh, Dr. Stiles tells us that we need to look at this with caution until additional work is done. There are a number of cropping scenarios, and at, at the current level of, of detail, there, there, there just isn't enough work to really fine-tune that. And that will be discussed more in Task 2.2. Issues affecting irrigation efficiency, such as irrigation system distribution uniformity, will be examined in Task 2.2. As I said, today's report doesn't go into that. And the, do the daily soil water balance model used in today's report, it's too complex for the agency to use moving forward, and so they'll evaluate alternative methods. And finally, uh, they, they are recommending we make some changes to the locations of the weather stations, improve the quality <coughs> of the data, use three weather zones, and increase the number of crop types from 5 to 21. Uh, today's report references or, or evaluates crop or plant required water, but not crop, not water for crop management. And uh, the task 2.2 report will include additional detail regarding how water required for frost protection, distribution uniformity, salinity leaching, et cetera, should be included in the agency's irrigation efficiency program. And that'll include specific recommendations for 
improving the program. So this concludes my presentation. Um, I can answer questions now, but I'm sure we're going to move on to Dr. Stiles. And uh, after that, I, you know, what we'd like to do is our recommendation in the staff report is to open the item up for discussion, consider comments, and then finally receive and file that report. Okay, great. Thanks, Rick. You bet. Dr. Stiles, good to see you again. See you. So here's your... Okay. I hold it on. Play with it here. Okay. So I'll have to stay organized to keep this within 20 minutes. So uh, uh, what I've done is uh, put together some of the summary uh, slides, figures, and tables from the report, and I thought it'd be best to kind of hit some of those. But what I also did is uh, put a couple of slides together with some of these uh, terms. Some of the terms that we used in this report um, are uh, um, not standardized terms, because we were trying to uh, do something that was matched up pretty close to how you guys were trying to do your program down here. And so some of the ideas and thoughts um, aren't necessarily perfectly matched up with what the industry standard was. So uh, part of my presentation will be uh, um, of just talking about some of this terminology to make sure everybody's on the same page. Now, I noticed it was on the website, the report's on the website, and I brought a couple of extra hard copies if somebody wanted to get a hard copy out of this. But uh, again, I'll, I'll kind of focus on the summary uh, material here and not try to talk too much about detail on each one. First, I've got, I've got to recognize uh, the main co-author on this, uh, Dr. Dan Howes. He's a professor uh, up at Cal Poly. Uh, he'll be joining our teaching program in, the, in uh, January here. And he's our uh, evapotranspiration expert. He does a lot of our water balance work for a lot of our professional studies that we've done for other water agencies, uh, districts throughout uh, California and throughout the Western United States. So I relied heavily on his expertise to come up with some of these estimates for this uh, crop water use here. Okay. So uh, I also want to mention, as Rick did, that uh, um, both Ben Faber and Larry Schwenkel were involved with the study, setting up the design for the report and going through the preliminary review of the, of the reports and then the final review of these. And they've signed off uh, on the report. It's kind of a unique uh, situation here to have them sign off on one of our ITRC reports. But uh, that was what was asked of us, and that's how we uh, formatted this. So we have an email communication that goes back and forth. We kind of debate the issues. We debate topics like whether the raspberry number is high enough or not high enough, or how do we handle the tunnel uh, condition on raspberries. So we've been going back and forth on very specific items, as well as some of the big picture ones on how we might handle the final calculations or, or what we might propose back to the agency. As Rick mentioned, this first phase is just looking at the crop water use values. The second part of the report, or this task 2.2 that we were required to do for this, um, is the second report that will come out. And that's where we're going to make uh, recommendations on the, on the changes, potential changes to your program and maybe some of the more big picture ideas. This is a little bit more of a focus on, on your crop water use numbers that are being reported and then what we feel like the, what's probably a little bit more accurate uh, uh, depiction of what's happening with the crop water use numbers. Okay, so as Rick mentioned, right now you're using five. We propose to use 21 different cropping uh, 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 types in order to come up with some of these values. So kind of keep that in mind as we go through these here. Dr. Stiles, can I just ask you one question as you're starting? Yes. You talked about when you do the second phase, you're going to come back with recommendations for modifications in our program. I assume that's going to be limited modifications to the program so that we most have the most accurate irrigation efficiency for crops, not taking into consideration whether we're an overdraft or not, and that whole other question of what is the total amount of water that we should be allocating. This. Is correct. That correct? I'm, we're just looking at it from the uh, a crop water use perspective and this whole idea of the irrigation efficiency. Great. And as I got, when I got involved with this a year ago, you know, I saw those numbers that were greater than 100%, and my, my comment then, and, and it will be today also, is that if you're over 100%, it looks like you're generating water. So from, a, from an irrigation technical standpoint, we don't like to report those values because it looks like it's creating something that we can't create. So, so what we're going to do is talk about how to resolve that issue. And I, I think we have a pretty straightforward solution. But the first step to that was is to get some realistic values for those crop water use values and not use some, some inflated values for some of the crops. Other crops, I mean, it was pretty close. You'll see as we report the data here today, my last slide will be on a comparison, a cross comparison for some of the crops versus some of the other crops to show which ones were kind of uh, off 
and which ones were not. Um, but I will caution you before you get to my last slide here. Um, we, we did this based on not looking at the leaching requirement or not looking at the frost protection, which we know is going to add a little bit extra water. So I did it just on the ETC, which is the main component of the water use for this allocation. So that we just did that first part. The second part's a little bit more complicated, and we, we shifted that to the second part of this evaluation. We're kind of floating ideas and, and getting some uh, input here before we do the second part. Okay? All right. So let's see. I, I guess I don't need to cover this. This was in Rick's slides. We had a task one that we collected data. Uh, we had a task 2.1, which were the subtasks uh, associated with putting this report together. So basically involved going out and reviewing uh, the weather station information that was available from Fox Canyon weather stations. We also reviewed uh, data that was available from the CIMIS uh, stations. CIMIS stations are the California Irrigation Management Information System stations. There's three of them out here. And uh, they have a different level of maintenance and quality control requirements uh, so that are set up on those sites. And so we were, it was readily available for us to compare, cross-compare the Fox Canyon uh, weather stations to the CIMIS weather stations. Okay. Um, we evaluated these grower survey responses. We took that information, collected all this stuff, and put it into a, um, this crop evapotranspiration modeling program that we use. And what it is, it's a daily soil uh, water balance approach. It's a very complex approach. It's the approach that we use in these other water balance studies that we've been involved with. And it seems to really characterize what's happening with the actual water use. It really takes into account things like the effective precipitation because it takes into account when you actually planted the crop and when the crop was harvested and when things, certain things may have been going on out in the field. So it's, it's, it's viewed upon as a little bit more accurate approach to trying to come up with these values. So what, what the, the base value that we were talking about here is this reference evapotranspiration. The reference crop that we use is grass. So typically you'll see a station set up out in the field like this and it'll be on top of grass because that's what you're trying to get the reference ET for. So uh, the ET is this crop, this basis that we're using. Um, it's based on a bunch of local parameters here, so it doesn't measure it directly. The primary variable that it collects to get the ET value is the solar radiation. So there's one key device on there that actually gets most of the data that we pick up and we can check for quality control, and it kind of drives the whole process here, and that's that solar radiation value. Okay, so these sites need to be sited correctly and they need to be well maintained in order for them to collect good data. Now, a lot of these sites have rain gauges on them also, but I, I will warn everyone that rain gauges on weather stations are, uh, are, are not the, the official way to collect rainfall data, um, especially with CIMIS. You know, it's kind of an added feature that they put on there, and uh, um, CIMIS stations in particular have been really bad about having uh, sprinklers hit their, their rain gauges, and then they shut it down for a month or two months, and then they turn it back on, and there's been some quality control issues. And the reason is because CIMIS doesn't report rainfall. Uh, NOAA reports rainfall. So they, they have it on there as a feature. They don't have it on there as a, something that should be utilized for a court case. So I, I just want to warn people of that because some of the data from the CIMIS stations, uh, especially the rainfall data, wasn't correct. Oops. Okay, so, uh, so let's see. We collected the weather data for uh, 10 years from the five uh, Fox Canyon stations, and we got all the station data that was available from the CIMIS. And we checked these key weather uh, variables, these weather parameters. And this is one of the key ones that came up that we saw some problems with. Um, this is the solar radiation. The, the dark or the solid line is, a, is the maximum potential solar radi radiation on a clear day. And basically that uh, is a function of latitude. So as you go out there, you can, you can set this up throughout the United States and say, okay, that's the maximum value. Now the blue dots represent the values that came from the weather station. So if they're significantly lower than the solid line, we know that there's some problem. If some of the data points are higher than the blue line, then we know there's a problem. So what we do when we take this data is we'll adjust it. Now I know there's foggy days. The foggy days are those blue dots that happen to be kind of below the mass of the other dots here. Let me see if I can kind of point to one up here. So here's a mass of the blue dots. This, first of all, should be closer to the top of the solid blue line. But these blue dots, these ones that are off on the bottom here, represent the cooler days or the foggy days is what that would represent. So the data, you know, is being collected okay. It's just offset. And so we see an offset. It's a systematic error. And then we can correct for that systematic error then. And that's what we did is we went in and did a recomputation or a recomputed value for each of the weather stations. So as you look through our report, you'll see the term recomputed ETO. And that just means we did our correction on it. Okay? 
So we had problems at all the stations. Um, I, I think that uh, some were more significant than others, but before 2006, the uh, uh, Fox Canyon stations had some significant errors. They were over-reporting the ETO. There were numbers like 60 when the numbers that we recomputed were like 42. So there was some over-reporting of the ETO values from about 2000 up through 2003, 2004. Companies were changed in that 2003, 2004 time frame, and there were still some issues. And then since 2006, the data has improved tremendously. Okay, so we've, we've seen uh, that they've had less problems, primarily from putting in new devices, new stations uh, out there. Okay. So this is a graphical representation of the problems that we saw with the sites, and then and we were doing this recomputation. We did this on a percentage basis. But you can see this is at uh, one of the, the different stations here. These are the five Fox Canyon stations. Um, early in the program here, they were over-reporting the data. So these are 30% errors, 20% errors. You can see significant amounts here. This is the time frame when there was a change in the companies, and then after 2006 here, uh, with the current company here, they still have some percent errors, but what, what we're looking for on this is this plus or minus type characteristic. You know, you're, you're never going to hit it just perfectly. You know, you can't always get the correct uh, solution on there, but you'd like to see some plus or minus. There's a little bit of a maybe a systematic, systematic error where they maybe overcompensated on some of the stations, but at least it's got back to being a little bit more of a corrected value here without having to do too much um, for adjustments on here. Okay, so these recomputed values, we had these, un uh, these unknown errors. We don't know why they were errors. We don't know if it was in the math. We don't know if the weather stations were bad. We don't know if the solar uh, device, the solar radiation device, the pyranometer was actually in the, uh, you know, reading incorrectly. We don't know what, what the cause of the problem was, but we know we had significant issues here. So we didn't really have much confidence in that data. Um, the quality control and our approach for checking this quality control, I just want to mention it's in this FAO publication. Food and Ag Organization. Rick Allen is the primary author. It's been updated to 2008, 2009. Um, that's an old date on it. But uh, I know they just did a re, uh, uh, well, basically went back through that document and updated with it, current information on the current uh, ETO calculations that they do. And so this is what we used for our quality control check on this. It's not just something that we came up with at the center. It's a standardized protocol for, for doing these corrections and these adjustments to the, to the data set. Okay, so here's a couple of the stations, and this is, uh, real quickly, you can see why we had a problem. These are not standardized site. They be, should be sitting over uh, turf. They shouldn't have any wind effects in the background. They shouldn't have uh, buildings close by. So these are a couple of the uh, Fox Canyon sites. Oh. There we go. And uh, this, this one in particular, it's in an enclosure area here with uh, buildings surrounding it. It's got uh, dry ground around it, the, the bare ground. That'll cause a extra uh, reflection off the ground when you have condition like that. Uh, now this one's out in the orchard and it's a little bit better, but again, it's supposed to be a reference crop and the reference crop is supposed to be a well-watered, well-grown grass out there underneath the station. Um, and this one's out here on the side. You can kind of get the, an idea that they're not sighted um, in optimal conditions. Now these are the SIMA stations and these are, um, sited uh, uh, quite a bit better. They are good site conditions. Now, on the one here, I don't like to see the landscape guys go out and clear out the bottom of those pods out there. They're actually supposed to have the turf growing underneath them also. But uh, I can live with that um, if I'm going out and critiquing a site. Now, I didn't include the third sim station, and the reason is uh, it's out in the middle of a sand trap. There's a little green patch in the middle of the sand trap, and that site needs to be resited. They, uh, the sim station that they put over at uh, Oxnard is actually not in an optimal location. So those, these, these two are, and so I wanted to cite those. Okay, so the current approach is to take a look at these five zones, looking at the five stations, the five Fox Canyon stations. So basically you have the five out there, and the grower can select which uh, station to use. So what I wanted to do is to show you our idea on what we propose to kind of change that approach here, uh, primarily because we saw some problems with trying to get ET data with the Fox Canyon sites. We see some problems with the SIMA sites, and we wanted to propose something that was going to be a little bit more straightforward. What was done back in the 70s, I'm not going to take credit for this because it's been around for a while now, is to look at the ET rate as a function of distance inland. Uh, these researchers did this work way back when, and they recognized that as you get co closer to the coast, and though I live in Moral Bay, so I live very close to the coast, and my wife will tell you it's foggy there way too often. So as you go further inland, out to San Luis Obispo, it's warmer and sunnier. And as you get further in, up to the uh, Tascadero and Paso Robles, you're going to get a function of, of ET as a function of distance inland from the coast. 
And this is the relationship here that they came up with back in 1974. So this approach has been out there for some time. It's not something new that we came up with. But what I'd like to propose is that we simplify this whole procedure by looking at three ET zones, going uh, uh, a coastal zone, a mid zone, and then a, a, an inland zone here. And uh, just before I, I uh, try to state my case too much here, what I want to do is plot it for you. So this is a plot of the Sima stations and the Fox Canyon stations. I've got two outliers over here, and I'm just going to blame them on bad sighting. But uh, basically, I have a nice inland relationship here of the ET rate as we go you know, further inland from the coastal area. And so this would kind of back up the approach that we would create three uh, ET zones that would reflect what was happening with the, the actual weather patterns as we go inland here. So uh, we, we incorporated the ideas with ET by, uh, by taking the information from the grower survey. So Dr. Faber and Dr. Schwenko went out and got this uh, detailed information on cropping patterns, um, plant dates, irrigation practices, and we incorporated all that information into our modeling. So as I mentioned, we use this soil water balance as our approach on this, and uh, we did the 21 crops. So I want to get to the tables here. Before I do the tables, I've got to tell you a couple of these uh, uh, definitions that we used in the report. A couple of them were... Are, are new. I'll just say that that way because uh, you probably won't find them out there on the internet or in other uh, reference material. And uh, what it is is we have the ETC, which is the crop uh, requirement, this total annual evaporation and transpiration for the crop. And the thing that's different about our definition than others out there that might be defining uh, ETC is we also include the non-growing season uh, evaporation. So if it rains on a bare ground out there, and it's on bare ground that you're going to later come back and crop, we include that evaporation component in ETC. Because ETC is supposed to be all the evaporation and all the transpiration that occurs on a field. So you're supposed to include those, that extra value. What happens is in our reporting of this, when if you look at our website of our ETC values, they tend to be higher than other reporting agencies. Okay? So then we have the ET of a growing period. Now we're only looking at when the crops are on the field. And that's going to be a different value. It's going to be lower because we're only looking at the growing period. Now, the bottom one, we have the GPIW. Some of you guys have probably saw that said, what the heck are these guys talking about? It's the growing period ET, which is similar to this last one here, growing period ET, but it's the ET supplied by the irrigation water. Because uh, some of the crops are growing here during the winter months, and you have the rainfall during the winter months, so some of the ET requirement is supplied by the precipitation. So what we had to separate in order to get this uh, allocation amount for for Fox Canyon is we had to separate out this value, which is the value supplied by the growers putting the irrigation water on the crop. Okay? So I, I, I know there's a lot of terms, so I, I think these things are a little bit easier if you do them graphically. So the ETC is the total value. That's the whole season. If you look at the January 1 to December 31 time frame, the G ET GPIW is the one that we're concerned with down here. This is the amount of water that uh, is being supplied by the irrigation water. This is the ETC that's supplied by the irrigation water only. The, the ET of the growing period, this green section right here, represents that effective precipitation. That's very, very difficult to determine out there. It's very difficult to come up with that value. But in our modeling approach, we can do this on a daily basis to, to, to determine, you know, does the water run off? Does it actually stay on the field? And uh, what is it doing out there? We're not using a generalized equation you know, that applies for the whole region. We're actually doing this kind of locally based on those stations. We can come up with a pretty good estimate of this for the year that we're doing. Now, I can do 2009, and I can get it really accurate. Now, predicting what 2011 is going to be is a little bit more difficult because I would have to rerun this whole program in order to come up with those values. So as Rick mentioned, that's a little bit too complicated, and it's probably way, way too expensive for an approach here. So at the end of my presentation, we're going to propose to do something a little bit different, a little bit closer to uh, match up actually how we handle this issue uh, when we do our statewide uh, um, um, other reports that we do uh, throughout the state with other districts here. So kind of keep that in mind. It's very complex to get this value, but we're going to simplify this for the approach that we're going to propose for, uh, for Fox Canyon. Okay, so this is another uh, graph that represents that same uh, deal. And so I'm going to have you focus on the blue uh, bars here, which is the ETC values. Now, you notice the ETC values. This is a crop. This is a, oh, I took the, there it is right here, spring vegetables. So it's just one of the cropping uh, categories that we had. So we have spring vegetables. Here's the blue lines. Those represent the ETC. That's what the crop water use is for that crop. So you notice right through here, that's the growing period time frame. 
Now there's a couple more blue lines out here. What those represent are uh, precipitation events that occurred later in the year. So you still get evaporation from those events. They go into the ETC calculation, but they aren't, aren't during the growing period. So we're not really concerned about those. Okay? So our ETC t value tends to be the highest value. The ET during the growing period is the green line here. So here's our ET during the growing period. And that's what you classically will see when you're looking at ET of a crop. It's just got a nice smooth pattern. It starts low, goes up high, and then comes back down um, at the end of its cycle here. So the green is what we're a little bit more familiar with. The ET of the growing period irrigation uh, from the irrigation water is the amount that's supplied by irrigation water. So it basically takes out the effect of, uh, effect of precipitation. So the, if you look at the far, uh, dark, the far one here, the purple one, it's going to be the lower values on these bars here. Now you notice that in April and May, they're almost the same values, right? So that's uh, um, the conclusion out of that is that there was no precipitation during those two months. And that's why those values are all uh, equivalent across the board there. Okay? So, uh, you know, it's a little bit uh, easier to understand this when you look at a few of the graphs. Now, I've got to, I'm kind of down to the last couple of slides. I added a few more after this. I, I kind of added a few lecture notes on this. I'm going to apologize right at the beginning here because I'm, as a college professor, I've got to throw a few of those out there. But I want to I stay on this one for a minute here so I can kind of explain where we are at this point with the reporting. These are uh, values for the three different zones that we've proposed. This is the uh, coastal zone, this mid zone, and then the uh, inland zone. So we have Z1, Z2, Z3, and that goes back to the zones that we uh, drew on the map there. By the way, those zones match up with what the uh, California DWR uh, uses for ET zones for the coastal area down here. They're very close to the same lines. If you look at uh, the zone characteristics that the CIMIS program sets up for this region, they're very close to that uh, value, those, those uh, zone lines that they separate for this area. So those are the three values up there. Those are the three zones. The, uh, where it says Fox Canyon, GMA, those are the different uh, stations. Now, these are the recomputed ETO values. They're not the ones, if you go to the 2009 results, you won't get the same values because we corrected them uh, to the values. So these were, this, is, this takes into account precipitation. It's exactly how you guys are reporting the data right now. And it gives you an idea of kind of the differences between the three stations here. Okay, so these are your reported values right now. And you notice a lot of values are the same because you only have uh, five different cropping uh, patterns in here. So, you know, they kind of fit into these different categories based on how the grower selected his crop into that, uh, that cropping category. Now, the next column here says modeled. Those are the ones that uh, were modeled as part of this report. And so the thing I'm going to focus on, because there's a lot of numbers up here, I'm going to focus just on the bold ones. Um, the raspberries, the uh, uh, lima beans, a single crop or a single vegetable crop that's planted out there. And then the one down here that I've done a lot of work on, uh, which is the strawberries. I've been working with the strawberry growers down here for about uh, two years, and we're starting our third season out here trying to make some modification on the um, historic uh, water practices out here on the Oxnard Plain. So the first one is raspberries. You can see the numbers are pretty close. They're not that far off. And by the time we add in some extra water for leaching, for frost control, and maybe some uh, uh, water to take into account uh, other factors out there, it's probably not going to be that far off on the estimate that was provided earlier um, you know, as part of this program. So, so we're in the range on the raspberries. We're, internally, we're kind of arguing about it right now because uh, you know, we're comparing raspberries to blueberries. There's not very much published data on it. We're kind of go uh, we're going by anecdotal stories about uh, gut feelings about if the number should be higher or lower. So we're trying to make some final tweaks to those values. But uh, I can comfortably say those values are, are relatively close to the previous values. And by the time we bump them up, we're probably going to be pretty close uh, um, on the end result. Now, the next one is the lima beans. Now, this is a single vegetable crop. Not very many growers do a single vegetable crop. Most of the growers do multiple uh, cropping. So you'll see down here, this is multiple cropping in a greenhouse. This is multiple cropping without a greenhouse. That's typically what the vegetable growers are doing. But just to emphasize my point, let's say somebody did a single vegetable crop in one season. If they did that, they would have a water use here in the coastal zone of 9.2 inches. That can, would compare to the 41.1. This is one of the reasons that you're getting 250 percent irrigation efficiencies on some of your applications, is some of the values are off because of those characteristics. That the ET value that's being, uh, for, the, for the crop that's actually being grown, by the time they put that allocated value in there, it's grossly over represents the amount of water that that crop might be using. So that's a good example of one that's kind of way off here. Now, there's other categories in here, other ones that are kind of close and some that are off. 
The, but let me go down and talk about the strawberries because the strawberries seem like they're way low right now. And I've worked with the strawberry growers out there and I know exactly how much water they put on on about uh, four different fields out here. We've done detailed studies using uh, magnetic meters. Am I going past my 20 minutes yet? Okay. I'll, I'll wrap up quickly here. So, uh, no, we need to hear you. <laughs> the, the problem that I ran into on this is uh, our study is looking at salinity. And if you look at the old salinity stuff that was done in the 70s, um, we shouldn't be able to grow strawberries out here on these soils on the Oxnard Plain. The salinity levels are too high. Uh, basically, by the chart, it tells us uh, if we have a, a, a salinity level of above a value of 1, we should start seeing a yield decline. And a value of 4, we should have a 100% yield decline. And right now, these growers out here are farming with levels of 5 to 7 out there, and they're getting a full crop. So our knowledge about what we know about salinity and the leaching components required for strawberries is, is lacking. It's something that we're trying to develop right now. Because if I go buy the book, I think it shows that we need about 100% extra water for irrigation leaching. And, uh, you know, so let's see, 23.2, if I double that number, 46, it actually comes out closer to the values that we used earlier here. We're, we're kind of struggling with that because I know I can't use the historic published values for doing leaching. And we're going to have to come up with something that's actually, uh, um, it's going to be new. And it's a little unnerving to be the first guy to, that publish some of this, publishes some of these values that are going to contend with the earlier uh, reporting requirements on this. But, but I think it's necessary because uh, I don't think it's 46 inches. I know how much water they put on. They put them on about 30 inches in, our, in the zones that we've been working in. So I, I, I know that number just because I've been working with these guys. And we have tons of sensors out there, and they have... Uh, automated stations and they do a fantastic job of really trying to uh, figure out what their water use is on some of these crops. So I, I have an, a good idea what the numbers should be. Um, I just, um, we're struggling with how to um, match up with what's published out there versus what we, we know we, we should uh, add for this extra water for that one component. The other one was strawberries and you talk to the strawberry growers, they'll tell you this story again and again, is the effect of the Santa Ana winds. Now, our conclusion after evaluating a lot of the data and looking at stuff is that the Santa Ana winds are incorporated in our ETO estimates. So I, I know that doesn't mean a lot with a sentence right now, but if you look at it, if you look at our ETO estimates and in the report, you, what you'll see, I'll, I'll just do it with my hands because I don't have a slide on But when the Santa Ana's come, the ETC goes like this and it comes back down. And if you look at the detailed daily values, we do pick it up in our ETO estimates. So we're not going to bump the number up just because of the ETO we feel that we've already incorporated that value in, the, in our estimates. And I think a lot of stations don't pick it up because they might have a, they, might, they don't necessarily pick up that extra value. They may think that it's a data point that's, uh, that's off and you've got to be careful. Uh, one thing is uh, adjusting a, uh, a built-in error in the programming. The second one is not adjusting when you know you have the Santa Ana conditions that might be happening or these east wind conditions that might be happening during the month of October uh, and, and November up here. So just to give you kind of a flavor for some of the numbers up here, um, again, this is our kind of our first shot at the base values, and then we're going to add to those values. Um, it's going to be plus, uh, if anything. There's a few of them that we're arguing about right now that they should go a little bit lower, but, but for the most part, the numbers are going to be plus. Our model numbers are going to go up for our estimate of what should be allocated to the growers out here uh, for their values. Okay, so uh, the next task is this task 2.2. We've, we've completed some of the evaluation on the task 2.2. We've looked at meter accuracy, we've looked at the acreage accuracy, and we've looked at distribution uniformity. Now, a couple of my slides on lecture here. What I found when I've talked to uh, people down here is that there's a little bit of confusion between what uniformity is and what irrigation efficiency is. Uniformity is something that we can go out there and measure very readily. If we have a drip irrigated field that has pressure compensating emitters on it, we can go out there and do a very scientific evaluation where we put cups under the emitters and we determine by mathematical approach what the uniformity is. And we get values on drip systems that are anywhere from 0.7 up to 0.95. Okay? A good system is above 0.9. A very poor system is below 0.7. Average values are around 0.8. Um, the uniformity can never be greater than 1 because 1 means that every cup has the same amount of water in it. It's always a decimal value when we report uniformities. Um, and it gives you an idea of how, how uniform the water is applied on the field. Even with a brand new drip irrigation system, it's not going to be one, okay, because there's manufacturer's uh, variations that come up. You know, they can't do a perfect job of making their plastic parts come out exactly the same every time. So that value is going to, 
it's going to mean that we're going to put extra water on because we can't put water on uniformly. It's the extra water that has to be applied. And this is what uniformity looks like. If you go out in the field and measure the values with cups on the water dripping on the top of the surface, I've got it drawn up here so it's the water actually penetrating through and past the plants in the root zone. Up on top, you can see that's poor uniformity. We're getting more water on one side of the field versus the other. And we can see this visually typically out there in the field. The crops are, uh, are dying. They're salting up on one part of the field if we have poor uniformity. On the bottom side, we have good uniformity. Not perfect uniformity, but we have good uniformity. We've improved it. We've gone to a better irrigation method, a uh, better management approach on our system there. So then we have this second term, which is what caused the problem um, down here when I saw some of the initial values. We have this efficiency term. Now, there's different ways to do efficiencies, but basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to look at that beneficial water uh, versus the applied water. The problem that you run into is that that beneficial water, if you're saying, okay, we, uh, we think the beneficial water is 42 inches and they're only putting on 25 inches, you end up with a value greater than 100%. Okay? It's you know, 42 divided by 24, you're going to get a value that's greater than 100%. That's not possible. It just means that you're generating water. Or you haven't accounted for all the places where the water may have come from. Or you're just overestimating what your ET is of your crop. So we always do it as a percentage. It's always got to be less than 100%. And uh, it makes it real clean. So this is my two slides on efficiency. So either you've got good efficiency, and you put on the amount that the crop is required, and you notice on the top slide up there, you notice that there's a, it's not a perfect line down here. And so the efficiency actually is very closely approximated in a very good uh, grower situation. It's approximated by what the distribution uniformity value is. So if we've done everything just right, I can say that the uniformity and the efficiency should be around 0.8 or 80 percent, which matches up real close with what the target value, values were for the Fox Canyon program originally. It was a target value of 80 percent efficiency, which I agree with. That's a very good approach and that's a good target value. The problem is how the efficiency calculation was being done. Okay? So, so just to go back to this uniformity idea for a second, um, pre-1990s, Lee Waddle was down here and had a program in place where he was doing evaluations. He came up with this. This was published, published by Blaine Hansen. These were the values for Ventura County here. They used to report DU in percent. So it's 0.66 are the values for DU. Okay? So uh, they just started the program again down here, and they haven't done too many fields. So this is a very small sample size. But this is what my expectation would be, is that these values are quite a bit higher. Because we have a lot more drip systems. We have a lot better technology in the drip irrigation uh, market out there. And so we're seeing values from 0.66 up to 0.79, which is very close to 0.8, which is what we pro would predict on an average basis for an for a area, is to have uh, distribution uniformity or irrigation efficiency values that are targeting about that 0.8 value. Okay? So keeping that in mind, these are the tasks that we're trying to do with task 2.2. And this is my final slide. So, um, so we have a couple of additional tasks. We're trying to get this extra water for salinity. We're trying to figure out how to handle this effective precipitation approach without having to rerun the model for every year and every rainfall event, because that could be very expensive, and I'd have to train somebody on how to do ET modeling, and that's just not easy to do. So we're trying to figure out a, an approach on this, and I'll, I'll give you my punchline right now before you read it in our TAS 2.2 report, is uh, what we've done to handle that issue in, uh, across the state right now, if you go to our website, you'll see the same approach, is that we use an average year, a wet year, and a dry year, and use the precipitation events in those three conditions in order to, uh, to set values for what the ETCs should be. So instead of having a monthly or a weekly or a daily calculation of what the ET values are, we just put together a, a chart or a standard table that would be the, ET, the ETC by zone and then by year type. And so we really simplify the ETs. It's just basically a couple of tables instead of having this be collected. And then the approach would be is you use your weather stations for a QC control on it um, and then have a standardized table. Now, I haven't written that part in the second part of the report, and we're kind of saying that out loud right now just to get a feeling from uh, uh, the Fox Canyon group here of, of how that uh, approach might uh, be viewed because it's a simplification of something that's extremely complicated, but at the same time we're trying to make it so it uh, reflects a little bit closer, uh, you know, the reality of, of what's going on out in the field out there. So that's, uh, that's one of the big things that's up there that doesn't have very many words associated with it. And then the last one here is to modify the equation. So what's been proposed, I should give credit to uh, Larry. If, if you like it, it's my idea. If, it's, if you don't like it, this is uh, Larry Schwankel's approach. But it's to basically take your approach here and flip the equation. 
and turn it into a ratio rather than an efficiency. So then what we're doing is, is um, we're taking your allocation approach, your irrigation efficiency approach, but we're looking at the allocation values, which is a little bit different than a true irrigation efficiency anyway. We're trying to come up with a value, a target value for what the growers should be putting on. So what will happen is when we use this allocation approach, we'll just take their applied water over their allocation amount or their allowance amount. We're still kind of struggling with the right word to use for that. But if the value is greater than one, that would mean they're putting on too much water. If the value is less than one, then they're doing a pretty good job. If the value is 0.8, that would meet our target value. But at least what we could do is kind of switch this thing around uh, to, to, a pro, to basically uh, come up with a new approach here so we can kind of start over with some new ET values that are more, cor that are co more correct than what are being used currently, use a zone approach to kind of simplify the, the procedure here, and then use this allocation, which can be easily defended and easily targeted on the, the, the uh, applications that may be overstating or understating what's actually going on in, on a specific field. So sorry if I went over by a few minutes um, there. So. Very good. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for, um, um, for the three of you doing the work that you, you did. Um, in my umpteen years here at this agency, this issue of efficiency and irrigation has been a sore subject for a lot of people for a long time. And having you guys go up to the mountain and do whatever you do at the mountain and come down and tell us what you saw is really the only solution to the problem. So I am very thankful that you've put the time and energy and obviously the enthusiasm. And I was at one of the annual workshops uh, that we did, you made a presentation. I think that's the first time I met you. And I said, somewhere along the line, we have to get you to do this. And you've, you've done that for us. So I'm pleased that you've accomplished task one. You're going to work on task two. I have a couple of questions, a couple of comments I'll throw out to you. And I wrote them down. The term efficiency we created when we created this ordinance that it falls into without any technical or academic understanding other than um, Simis produced through the state a, a, a number that we could use. I personally am not wed to the term efficiency. If in your analysis to make the system work, you want to generate a new term, and in my world, it's index. If you irrigate against the index that the GMA board says ought to be for our area and this crop, by definition, by, de by our world, you're efficient. And if that's a different way of dealing with it, you know, you say, if it's equal to or greater than one, it's good. Uh, no, if it's equal to or less than one, it's good. If it's equal to or greater than one, you've done something wrong. But what we're, what we're trying to do is take what is an academic term, an efficiency, put some kind of lipstick on it to meet our criteria. If, if in your analysis you say, you know what, you ought to have your own term. My term is index. You can come up with your own term and back that in and say, if you meet the index for this crop in this area against this standard, you are, by definition, as far as the GMA agency is concerned, you are efficient. If that helps you and gives you that flexibility, personally, I'm okay with that if that makes academic and technical sense. Um, the other one is you had a chart up there that listed uh, a whole bunch of crops, and you broke out citrus um, specifically, 20, 50, and whatever percentage cover. I assume that's size of trees and canopies and the like. But we didn't do that for avocados. I'm, uh, and avocados, to me, are more problematic than citrus in a lot of ways because they start off as very little trees, much slower growing than citrus, and then they turn into very big trees, and then we have to go through this thinning process. So I'm wondering if we have to actually expand categories because one category of avocado does not re reflect, in fact, the cropping pattern that an avocado goes through through its life cycle. So I. I I question that. And another example is you have nurseries. Nursery, if you go out to Moore Park and you look at the Barron Brothers, that's a full-blown nursery. None of, a very little of that is under canopy. It's all outdoor shrubs. There's tons of, of um, nursery growers in the county that grow large nursery plants that you plant on the side of the road. There's also a ton of nursery growers that are in full, what I vision as a nursery, uh, a, a, an enclosed facility. You used the term earlier 
um, vegetables greenhouse and vegetables non-greenhouse. And I'm wondering if the same issue has to be dealt with in the nursery family. I don't know. I do know that when we created Ordinance 5, the predecessor to the current ordinance, we shied away from addressing the nursery issue. One, because it wasn't that extensive in the county. And two, it was incredibly complicated. And we were lucky enough to get what we got on paper and came up with the wrong terms. But going forward, I think the nursery industry, as evident over the last few years, is getting more complex and has been the point of some of the biggest debates we've had as a board in terms of overusing and overpumping water and some of the biggest fines that we've had to make or penalties we've had to collect has been in the nursery world. And so I'm, I'm wondering if there's a way to make sure that we have the right categories for nurseries. And then my last comment is, and I, I recognize uh, when uh, Dr. Bachman goes through his analysis of what's below the ground. You're dealing with what's above the ground. <laughs> but both of you guys are professors. And then he gives the, G the United Board the professor answer. Well, I don't know. It depends. So uh, I understand when you do modeling, <laughs> when you do modeling, you have to create a model that, that works. The problem I have is, or the question I have is, I guess, if we do... If we do modeling and measure it with a micron, and then we turn around and come up with a solution and cut it with an ax, have we gained anything in the process? Have we lost so much because we've done such great measurement, but to actually implement it, we have to have so much margin of error, have we gained anything in the process? That's a concern. Measure with a micron, cut it with an ax, you don't gain anything. But you, you, did, you went through a great academic exercise, but it's the ax cutting that we really have to look at. Does that make sense? Yes, definitely. So, would you like me to respond quickly to your Yeah, uh, those, your are, those are just comments, and I don't want to... So, those are great comments, because our second report's due in a couple of weeks here. So, I, <laughs> I'm looking for feedback today, and anyone else that might have feedback on the first uh, go-through on this, because we need to get these in. Now, it's a model that's been created. So, going in and, and creating a, a young avocado tree or a 20 and 50 percent avocado tree, is, is very doable because we just throw it in the model now. We have all the data in. It's, it's not hard to do to make those modifications and make a decision. We made a decision based on the 25 grower survey that we did. Um, that was kind of the limit. That's what we set up on the deal. We could have done 100 growers and then got a different set of input, and then we would have done a different model based on that input. So we, had, we just went with what we did. And we're, I'm not local down here. I know a lot about strawberries, but I'm not local down here. So I was kind of relying on Ben. Uh, Dr. Faber to come up with if we needed to do those other tweaks to the categories. Uh, uh, and un please understand my, if in your analysis and Ben's analysis and chatting with growers and guys out here that are actually growing those crops and they don't see it as a problem, then it's not a problem. I'm raising the question. Okay. okay. And, we'll, and we'll do it because so Ben's not a problem, raised it's another not a question. He's okay. questioning on that raspberry number, for example. And, and I'll, I'll, let me specifically address raspberries with the tunnels because it's a different way to grow. You know, they put tunnels on them now. And we were talking, I was talking to some growers about it, and I said, well, you know, you put more water on the raspberries, right, because of those tunnels. They said, no, no, no. The ET under those tunnels, it's cooler, so the ET must be lower. You know, there, there's anecdotal stories about that. And I said, well, wait a minute. What about when it rains? They said, yeah, what about it? And I said, well, the rain doesn't get to the crop. So you have to put that water on, on a tunnel uh, system, um, you have to put more water on because that rainfall hits the non-tunnel system because the plastic will block that water from hitting the, going to the crop. And so the growers said, oh, yeah, you're right. You know, I hadn't thought about it that way. So, so we're dealing with some of these things that aren't published. They're kind of anecdotal, and we're trying to come up with the best way to handle it. There's not a lot of ET information about what goes on inside of a hothouse or a greenhouse or a tunnel type system because most of us have solar radiation devices for trying to determine those values and they work when they're under the sun. They don't really work when you're under a tarp or under a greenhouse roof. And so we just, we just don't know how to handle it. I mean, I, I don't want to give you that it depends answer, but we came up with the, the best answer okay. that was made available to us with the information that we had out there you know, right now. And, and, and if you guys think it's 10% high or 15% high, I'm, I'm certainly willing to take that input from growers, you know, from others that are interested in this, and, and we can evaluate that, incorporate it. I've got to sell it on to two other individuals. It won't be just me. So it's kind of worked out pretty well in this report. You know, it's not just one person making a decision on this. There's three of us that are involved. Um, your other comment on the, uh, let's see, I can't read my handwriting now without my glasses. Um, on the categories, 
um, I'm, I'm, we're more than happy to, to expand or contract those. Um, however, we kind of took the same approach that we used for the statewide ETC reporting that we did, is we kind of took general categories and we didn't tweak for the smaller things. So I tried to follow the same approach that, that we have used in the past to report these values. And, but there's always time. Guys will call me. I did a presentation up in uh, Solano, and I did a group, group of 10 growers, and I said 23 inches, and they, they almost threw something at me and kicked me out in the first five minutes of my presentation. And they said, our number is five. And I said, you mean five inches per irrigation? They said, no, five, ir five inches in the whole irrigation season. They cut back their vines so much up there that the plants just don't use that much water. And plus, the, at the time, they liked to really stress the heck out of those things for quality not quantity of the grapes coming out. They were trying to specifically mani manipulate sugars and tannins in their grapes. So we created a whole new category for them for their local condition on, on uh, red, okay. red grape uh, vineyards. And the, the number was 25% or less of what the published value was. And we're more than happy to make those tweaks because obviously we're not going to pick up every one of those uh, categories in our first time through. It's easy to put those into the model. I'm sure Dan is watching on TV and He's cringing as I say, we'll add those things in. But, but, but now's the time to do it, for us to do it. Otherwise, after this time period, you know, we can't do it. I mean, it's, we're at the end of our time period for our contract is all. And, and we can train somebody. We can show people the process, but it's a little bit more complicated to get somebody to actually put those in and rerun the model. Right, again, don't put them in because I said to put them in. I'm just asking you to ask the question if there should be some more there. So. Well, we have good input. And if there's others that would like to provide input, um, you know, we'll be more than happy to, to put it in. But like I said, I'm kind of on a pretty tight timeline okay. based on what we put out there for the um, initial report. My expectation is we'll have task 2.2 out by uh, let me, let me uh, let Mike and uh, Dave. You know, Dr. Stiles, really appreciate your work and, and, and your attempts to bring this program into something that's a little more legitimate is, is really appreciated, even from the ag perspective, I think, because it's important. But um, the survey of 25 growers, what was the composition of that? Group? We tried to get a mixture of uh, areas, you know, for the different regions, and then we did, we tried to get across the different crops. So uh, um, again, uh, Dr. Paper was the one that uh, was responsible for that, and went and did a confidential list of, the, of who he interviewed and, and then came up with that distribution. And then the, re the results of that are in the back. We've included it as one of the attachments in the back if you want to look specifically okay. at what kind of results we got out of that. We, we put the numbers together for you. 25 sounds significant, but when I started thinking about it, and, and I just I think about a lemon grower in, in Santa Paula growing in all those rocks or in, in Ojai versus a lemon grower out on the coast yeah. with a lot more uh, moisture and fog and and uh, the, all the various variability of microclimates we have here and how that really might throw those numbers off. I do appreciate that, that three zones concept and, and also you're trying to make things, make your values and whatnot not so nailed down month by month, minute by minute that it begins to be a management nightmare for staff because in a sense this does kind of have to be an index, it's something that is somewhat one size fits all, and I guess what I'm trying to say is that I would hope that we don't get values that are pitched in one direction or the other. You're taking into account soil types and, and, and uh, microclimates, I'm sure, but um, I guess I'm saying that is, has to be kind of an average situation as well, I would think. Right. I don't know what your comment is there. Well, my short comment is, you know, we'd propose 10 because I was concerned about the cost of doing survey work. and. Um, Feedback from the board or from Rick was that we should bump it up to 25, and so my first comment was, well, it's going to be more expensive, and 50 would have been, you know, it, it just, it's very expensive to do that survey work is all, especially when you're talking to individual growers and trying to get stuff that's uh, done correctly, and so 25 was kind of our compromise, you know, for, for the value and the cost of what we were trying to collect. And, and, then, and then we had Ben do it, who's local here, so he's got more experience with working with individuals and different conditions, different salinity conditions, and we were hoping that would kind of bring in a lot of that, that essence of that also. That was, that was our thought uh, process. I'm on sure it. he I, did. And I didn't send grant students down to interview the growers. I, you know, that was done by experts you know, for, the, for that information. And he's very knowledgeable to our various microclimates. So I'm just, you know, if you, if you had three citrus guys in your surveys, that may not be a very significant uh, group, for example. If you had more more berry guys versus uh, 
greenhouse flower growers, again, you may not have a very significant data. Right. We tried to spread it out by zone and then by crop type is, is what the idea was when, when he was putting those together. We d I mean, we did the best we could with only doing 25. I, I agree, 25 isn't a lot, but we tried to do as best we could as far as spreading it out. You can get an idea from flipping through the back of them, which, which ones we did and how many for the different cropping uh, patterns that were out there. Mike. Mr. Chairman, it seems to me that we can later go back after we work with this a bit and if we want to expand the crop numbers or something, but I'm just really pleased with where you've gotten us. More importantly, for the group that's sitting out here, um, the the question of the 200 percent efficiency, and I had one of my member people at uh, cost said uh, John Grether by specific was called up and asked how in the hell he got 200 percent on his lemons. If you looked at um, the small trees, 20 percent canopy allowed versus your modified, that was 196 percent. If I'm calculating my numbers right, mm -hmm. so when he reported honestly. People were saying, "Well, yeah, you're fudging somehow." Fact is that he wasn't, and and your your work has proven my point that where everybody claiming that the farm community is cheating on this stuff is not true. Okay, Charlotte. Um, does anybody in the audience have any specific questions for uh, Dr. Stiles? Sam. Uh, well, I got to get Sam. We got to get you on the microphone. So. Um, okay. Sam McIntyre, Burwood Water. Uh, one of my comments to the doctor would be: I, I'm involved in four large water entities, and my problem is that it's the, usually the avocado grower that's wasting the water, and normally by over irrigating. And I, I think that they really should be included. Okay, in different categories. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. Subcategories, yeah. All right, um, Henry. Henry Gromlich, Cuyahoga Municipal Water District. Uh, I had a question on the zones. Uh, the way all of the uh, the way you were able to line up the weather stations was that done solely on the basis of distance from the coast, so that it corresponded with the the uh, previous study or was that done on the basis of received values from those stations and correlated? It was a real simple plot of miles inland, mm -hmm. you know, kind of a direct line right. miles inland, and then the ETO value. So my, miles inland was on the x-axis and the y-axis was the ETO values on the plot that I did. On the previous study from 1974, they plotted it as a percent of the inland value ET. Okay. So the two curves were slightly different, but they basically reported the same type of value. Yeah, I, I, I would defer to the ag community. I think the the width of the valley also plays a key role in this. So um, I know Santa Paula, Santa Clara Valley is outside the GMA, but uh, the larger width of that valley in particular allows for greater circulation of, of uh, ocean-influenced uh, air and I would imagine that you'd find something similar in the Santa Rosa versus Las Posas Valleys, but I just offer that as something you might want to look into. Okay. All right. Anybody else have any other questions for Dr. Stiles? Um, all right. So, uh, excellent. Again, we're going to see the final report, right, uh, or the second phase of the task uh, as kind of a, a sidebar, um, and it's something we'll have to debate at some point in time, but, uh, Dr. I, I I would not, personally, I would not be opposed is if there's a task 2.3 that needs to be done that we don't know what that task is. But since the two, the three of you have spent so much time and energy, and this is a major component of what we do at the GMA, if at the end of your analysis you say, you know, you ought to do task 2.3, and that task is as a way to either monitor how we're doing on the previous task or to finalize the two previous tasks, I'm open to entertain that suggestion. So I leave that to you to say, and it may be that our staff will come up with whatever task 2.3 is. I don't know, but I can't believe that the complexity of the problem can be solved with two tasks and there isn't some follow-on down the road. I don't know what that follow-on is, and I don't know what the time frame is, but I would, I'd be more than welcome to have you make a presentation to the board that says we ought to be looking at some additional items. 
if in fact that's true. I wouldn't be a very good businessman if we didn't propose that we could uh, do ah. that. Um, however, I will say that as part of this study, um, we were attempting to do a subcontract with the UC folks, and we were not able to do that. So there's, there's at least $15,000 that we're not going to spend on the uh, contract amount that we did this. What that really means is Ben Faber and Larry Schwenkel are, are covering their costs on doing this study because they're very interested in this and they want to participate in it. And I was not able to reimburse them directly. Um, they haven't, I mean, basically they were just trying to get their travel costs covered and they were going to have a statistician, but we found out we couldn't hire somebody. You'd think the UC and the Cal State system could work together, but uh, unfortunately that was not done. But I'll always with these types of reports, if we see any shortcomings, we make, uh, we'll, we're more than happy to make those recommendations, even if they, if they happen to involve us or don't involve us. Um, you know, that, that's something that we would put together as part of the recommendations. Okay. Mike? Uh, with Ben off for a year on a sabbatical, would it maybe be logical for us to uh, wait one year and when he's back and your guys are back together again, maybe do our next follow-up? By then, perhaps you would have had a chance to look at what we've done? No, because I want to finish. But, but I will take that under advisement. Um, Dr. Faber, it wouldn't surprise me if he's watching us on the video right now. He's been very active in responding back. He's on sabbatical, but he's in Turkey. Uh, he's know. been responding back, uh, corresponding uh, back quite frequently on some of the comments. And I, I've, I've been pleased because I think he actually, you know, he's still getting revved up still yeah, with what he's right. doing over there. So it's just a little here, difficult from really Turkey busy. to do grower reviews here. Well, like I said, if you ask us to do 25 more interviews, then, then I would say, yes, we probably want to wait till next summer, and I'd probably want to maybe adjust our, our uh, timing on this. My deal is, is I've got my ET expert that's writing the report right now, and we're, we're doing the final components of task 2.2. So it's not like I have 80% of it left. We're at the last stages of getting those final components in here, and I'm just looking at terminology. We took the 2009 uh, application data that was supplied by the growers and we put it in and we've already started tweaking and doing scenario analysis with our uh, ratio, our index evaluation, so I could see how many growers it would affect, how negative, how much of a negative effect it would have on the growers just with our, with our base values. And so as I tweak, as we go in and add the leaching values and the frost control values, you know, I can get a good feeling for how many are over 1.0 and and what's the impact of those 1.0 uh, values? I mean, is it a value of two or is it a value of 1.01? You know, so we're already we're already at that stage. I appreciate the extra year. I I called EPA and I asked for an extra year on another contract yesterday, but this one we're actually fairly close to kind of getting onto a to a summary point. Now I'm more than happy to the extent I was thinking was you know the 2.3 that he was commenting on that I would hopefully you'd proceed aggressively on what you've got and then we can see. How it works later. I'm more than happy to leave it open. We'll, we'll, leave, we'll be short on this contract. I cannot spend the, the amount of money I have left in the time I have left. I, I know I can't do that. So I, I know we're going to be short on this contract. I'd be more than happy to propose a task three with the remaining funds and we leave it open from our side. But I, I would like to stick to the contract I'm, timelines that I agreed to with Rick because we've kind of been working backwards from that. And we have that capability to finish the okay. document as is. Now, I'm more than happy to say with task 2.3, we take more grower feedback. You guys get a chance to absorb the information. And we make another tweak. We run the, we run the data set. We do four zones instead of three zones, maybe to pick up more of the microclimates on one side of the valley or the other va uh, side of the valley. I, I'm more than happy to say, okay, at that end stage, we could, we could do that. That way we don't have to reauthorize or, or set up a different amount. But yeah, I, uh, I, I think you need to finish the task that you have, but when you finish it and bring us the final document, I would expect you to say, by the way, as a follow-on to this, this is what the next step should be, and I think, you know, we, we need to look at that. Okay. All right. Okay. Very good. Thanks, Doc. All right. Very good. Anybody else? Okay. Um, we're going to go in. Charlotte's got to leave here in two, five, minutes. Oh, five minutes. Okay. Um, we've got... Um, uh, executive report. Any questions on the executive report? Can we move? Okay. Motion to second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. We're going to adjourn to closed session. Um, Al, are you going to make a report out of closed session? No report. Okay. No report out of closed session. Anybody else have anything? All right. There you go. Thanks. Bye.